It's seven o'clock on March 8th, 2021, and I ask the clerk to please call the roll. Um, good evening, Council Member Betts. Good evening, President, uh, participating remotely from Richmond, Virginia. Uh, Council Member Dunbar. Present, participating remotely from South Lansing. Council Member Garza. I'm, I'm here and I'm participating remotely from Lansing, Michigan. Council Member Hussein. Present, participating uh, remotely from Lansing, Michigan. Council Member Jackson. Present, participating remotely from Lansing, Michigan. Council Member Spadafore. Present, participating remotely from Lansing, Michigan. Council Member Spitzley. Council Member Wood. Um, present and participating remotely from Lansing, Michigan. There are seven members present in the quorum. Council member Spitzley is absent and we are to the meditation and pledge of allegiance. Thank you. Is there anybody um, that council would like us or council or mayor or clerk would like to have us keep in our thoughts as we meditate this evening? Uh, council member Jackson. Thank you. Just to keep in our thoughts and prayers, the young man that was shot and killed uh, on March 6th, the young teenager and prayers and condolences to the family and friends who knew him. Nobody should have to die by a gun and we pray that their family seeks peace and recovery. And that's it. Thank you, Councilmember Jackson. Councilmember Garza, did I see your hand? Yes, I too wanted to keep the Lopez family in prayers as uh, they move forward in this tragic uh, development that happened with their family. Very good. Thank you. Um, so as we reflect this evening, please keep the Lopez family in your thoughts. Do I mean a moment of uh, silent meditation, please? Thank you. Uh, the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Okay. You have for your approval the uh, council proceedings of February 22nd. Mr. Vice President. Sure, I would move the uh, meeting minutes of February 22nd. There's been a motion before us. Is there any discussion on the proceedings? Seeing none, Mr. Clark, would you please call the roll? Council Member Hussein. Yes. Councilmember Jackson. Yes. Councilmember Spadafore. Yes. Councilmember Wood. Yes. Councilmember Betts. Yes. Councilmember Dunbar. Yes. Councilmember Garza. Yes. Seven yeas, zero nays. The uh, proceedings are approved, and we are to uh, community. Uh, I'm sorry. Somehow. Agenda got out of order. Were two comments by council members and the city clerk. All right, uh, we'll make this up as we go. Um, council members, are there any comments from council members? Seeing none, uh, city clerk. Oh, sorry, Vice President Hussein. I'm sorry. I was looking for my uh, my mute button. Uh, President Spadafore. Um, just a quick, just a quick uh, comment, and then I'd like the. Um, the mayor to look into something for, um, you know, for Southwest Lansing, for the Churchill Downs neighborhood. Um, I visited with the Churchill Downs neighborhood a few weeks back. Um, they had started up their uh, meetings again uh, virtually, um, and they, you know, as always had a fantastic turnout. And so there was just great conversation, a lot of discussion about, you know, what they're looking to do this spring and summer to move their neighborhood forward, um, a reflection kind of on some of the things that they've been able to do uh, over the past several years to move their neighborhood forward um, and to make sure that, you know, it's a, it's a great place for, for folks to live. Um, but then there were some concerns that were shared as well. Um, and I, I know we'll discuss some of the concerns um, that they have with one of our agenda items a little bit later. Um, so I won't uh, touch on that. But I did want to talk about a blighted building at 2206 West Jolly. So this is on the northwest uh, corner of Pleasant Grove and Jolly. Okay. Um, it's a kitty corner to Fire Station 6. Uh, this is a property that I've been advocated. I mean, it is an absolute blighted building and a blight on that neighborhood. Uh, as well as that corridor. And this is a building um, that I've been advocating for in terms of um, uh, its demolishing, if you will, um, dating back to about 2017. As a matter of fact, um, the first show cause make safer demolished letter on this building went out, in, uh, I believe it was January of 2018. 
Um, and so we, um, meaning myself, um, the neighbors in that area um, were ecstatic. Um, we thought, um, you know, we would see um, some headway with the, uh, regards to this problem. Um, unfortunately, through 2018 through in, in 2019, we saw uh, no movement. Um, I advocated obviously um, and worked with the building safety manager, um, worked with economic development and planning. Um, and there's just been one reason or another um, you know, that, that we haven't moved forward uh, with the, uh, the make safer demolish process and actually getting this building down. Um, and so when I say, I should have said 2018, 19 and 20, um, I've been working on this um, with very uh, little success. Uh, and so I made sure um, that that neighborhood knew I would address this as part of this council meeting, um, that I would officially, um, Mayor Shore, put this in, in your lap. Um, because again, this is something that we, for one reason or another, have not been able um, to achieve any measure of success on, uh, but it is an absolute headache uh, for all uh, in that area. So we'd like to see if possible uh, some board movement on that. So again, and let me give you that address one more time. It's 2206 West Jolly. Okay, uh, Mayor gave you a thumbs up. I'll let him address if he wants to respond in his comments because we do have another council member who wants to make some comments. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Mr. Uh, Mr. Council Member Jackson. Thank you, Mr. President. And I was I was going to hold off this week, but I just got to announce that if anybody wants to receive the fourth order, a newsletter, um, please email me at Brian T. Brian T. Jackson at lansingmi.gov. And I'll be happy to add you to the list. It's just another opportunity, a way that we can try to connect through email and um, information sharing by emails. And it's been working pretty well so far. And every time I make an announcement, I get a few more people. So can't skip it this time. And I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Jackson. Mr. Clerk. Uh, thank you, President Spadafore. Just a couple of things. Um, for those who do live in the Waverly uh, or Holt school districts, we did send out um, absentee ballot applications uh, last week, so you should have gotten that by now if you're a registered voter living uh, with your register to vote in those school districts. So uh, we do have a May election coming up. Also, I wanted to announce a couple of things about um, our marijuana licensing process. Um, first, uh, there is a letter to council in the packet um, just highlighting the fact that uh, the state of Michigan added the city of Lansing to the social equity program. Uh, we were not recognized as part of that under the previous uh, gubernatorial administration. Um, so we are now under that. Um, however, I do wanna highlight that all of our capped licenses, which generally are the ones uh, several other ones that have lower um, income threshold to get into, uh, we have already kind of reached the caps. Uh, the, the only remaining license that really would be helpful is the uh, fourth ward micro business. So I do just want to highlight that and kind of put it in council's um, ball court that if we want to have a discussion about uh, that in the future, um, I'm, I'm definitely open to the discussion. Um, secondly, I wanted to um, let the council and members of the public know that um, we did uh, determine a deadline. Uh, we have several of our businesses that were approved conditionally in the very first phase of our licensure on the medical marijuana side, uh, which uh, was a couple of years ago. And there are several uh, that haven't actually met those conditions and come to licensure yet. And we did give them a deadline of the end of September to uh, get their license or uh, risk uh, action being taken against their license um, so that we can bring them um, into full operation um, for, for a number of reasons, uh, jobs in the city, uh, protecting uh, the consumers uh, so that there's not a, a unnecessarily constricted market. Um, as well as uh, there is a revenue impact to the city. Um, and then the final thing that I wanted to highlight uh, on marijuana is that um, we did receive uh, revenue uh, sharing from the state on the uh, medical licenses of uh, $280,000 uh, check that was based on the number of active licenses we had in the city as of uh, the end of the state fiscal year in 2020. So um, some some. Good news there uh, on that front. Um, so 
Um, thank you for your time. And that takes us to community event announcements. If there's anyone uh, in the um, viewing audience that has a community event, uh, now is the time to raise your hand and we will give you up to a minute to um, tell us the details of your community events. So right now this is just community events. Uh, and I see one hand so far, the advocates. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yep, we can hear you. Mike Lynn uh, with Black Lives Matter Lansing, letting you all know that we are holding a People's City Council and Mayoral Candidate Town Hall this Thursday, March 11th uh, via Zoom. Um, people are asked to are strongly asked to uh, register prior. You can register your questions uh, for the candidates through uh, Eventbrite, which you can find on uh, Black Lives Matter Lansing's uh, Facebook page. Um, also, as of right now, we have committed Kathy Dunbar, uh, Verge Bonero, and Brian T. Jackson. Um, and we have some declines that we will be um, making public here soon. So every candidate that has expressed interest and has uh, their name in the hat has been invited to this. Uh, so March 11th at 6 p.m. Um, that's it. So I appreciate you all. All right. Thank you. Any other, I don't see any other hands for community events. Um, so that takes us to speaker registration for public comment on legislative matters. Tonight, legislative matters includes, uh, we have two public hearings, um, as well as the uh, ordinances for passage, consent agenda and resolutions. Um, so any of those items, please begin raising your hand. Again, we will stop accepting raised hands uh, once the first uh, person finishes speaking. Um, and uh, while you all are raising your hands, uh, please also listen up for the mayor's comments. Mr. Mayor. Thank you, um, Mr. President, Mr. Mr. Clerk, please listen up, I like that. Um, <laughs> uh, I have a, a few, um, things to share. Um, first, we get notification that we're passing on that, uh, that Mishta is making citizens eligible for $10,000 in down payment and closing cost assistance from the state. Um, it's about 236 zip codes throughout the state. Uh, I wanna say most of Lansing is included, but not all. Um, so you're welcome to contact my office. To qualify for the program, borrowers have to complete a home buyer education class and have less than $20,000 in liquid cash assets, according to the state. Um, there are other limits as well on home purchase price and total household income. So uh, council members, if you know anyone, please send them to, to our office or to our EDMP office and, and they can work with MISHTA to make sure to assist uh, as necessary in addition to many of the other programs that we already have. Um, uh, the Humana Medicare changes kicked in for uh, post-65 retirees, so if anyone's hearing any questions or concerns, please let us know. Uh, Judy Keeler has been on the ball with this. Uh, I know she gave a, a presentation to the Ways and Means Committee, although my understanding is the video that she had didn't work. She was very disappointed because it was a really good video. Um, but, uh, but that has changed, um, and any of the reimbursements that need to be made will be made. So if anyone's hearing anything from our, any of our retirees, please um, send them to my office, send them to Judy, um, and we'll get them over or get them right to Humana directly. Um, Serve Lansing, we'll be doing a March 27th Baker neighborhood cleanup. So if you are in the Baker neighborhood and want to help out with cleaning up or you just want to volunteer with Serve Lansing, um, March 27th will be the day to do that. Um, we are going to be announcing that we are naming our snow, snow plows. Um, after we announced the new uh, plow map online, which uh, when it snows, you know where your plow is within 15 minutes. Um, now we'll name the snow plows and I'm very much hoping we won't need that for the rest of this year as it was 60 something degrees today, but it's March in Michigan. So we'll, uh, we'll wait and see. Um, wanted you all to know council members and, and any members of the public, uh, we are planning to, to get to you hopefully by the next meeting, but very soon. Uh, language for renewal of the police fire and roads millage. Um, I am supportive of renewing that. Renewing that. Um, I hope you all are as well. And uh, I want to get that to you so that uh, assuming council passes it, we can get that on the ballot for August. 
Uh, I know legal is working on that language, and I know that has come up as a question to me, maybe by a few of you, um, that we are getting that language and, and we'll get it to you or legal will get it to you. Um, many of you went through this five years ago, so many of you have more experience um, moving this through than I do, but I am fully supportive of that millage for our police and fire department and our local roads. So we'll be getting that to you. Um, also, um, I'm sure you're all paying attention as close as I am. The, uh, the federal government, uh, the Senate has passed their American recovery stimulus bill. Uh, and that is now over to the, the, the uh, US House of Representatives. We're expecting a vote tomorrow. Um, our, our US senators were incredible, Gary Peters and Debbie Stabenow. And we know Congresswoman Slotkin has been a champion for, um, for this legislation. And uh, um, we're very much hopeful and expecting that this will pass the US House tomorrow and be signed by President Biden. Um, so we'll, we'll keep you updated as that comes in and we'll have our budget in two weeks. And this certainly will affect our budget numbers. So everything is, is liquid and, and uh, in process until we have this finalized and we'll have you our budget in two weeks. But uh, that's good news that the federal government is helping out um, cities and counties and states throughout the nation where, um, where we need it due to the coronavirus pandemic and the, the financial effects. So good news. Um, and hopefully we'll have even better news once this is signed and, and passed and, and we'll be able to, to move forward. So that's what I've got, Mr. President. Uh, thank you, everybody. Oh, Councilman Hussein. Yes, we will, we will take that on. Um, I'll make sure to, that Mark uh, Lawrence, who's on this call, uh, will follow up on that and we'll, we'll figure out the status and, and get moving on that. I appreciate you, you bringing that up as always. Um, I also heard from the neighbors in Churchill Downs about the two issues that I believe you referred to. Um, so uh, I'll keep a, we'll keep in contact with you as well as the neighbors in Churchill Downs. I know you're, a, you're, you're their big advocate. So we appreciate you and, and bringing that. I appreciate you bringing that to, to me and to council. Thank you, Mr. President. Yeah, sure, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Councilmember Dunbar has her hand up. Uh, there's a question. I do. You know, I was making sure I was unmuted. Um, one was a question on the MISHTA program. I saw that, but I couldn't. I couldn't tell whether or not it was for first-time home buyers only, or if anybody um, buying a home in the city of Lansing and those um, zip codes counts. Um, does anybody know the answer to that? That's my first. I think it was anybody. Um, I'll check that. I, I don't want to be definitive. I, I, I'll check that. What I wrote down was anybody, anyone buying a home in these 236 zip codes. So I think it's anyone, but you have to meet the, the, uh, the cost qualifications. So um, again, it was less than $20,000 in liquid cash assets um, and a few other conditions. But I, I think it's anybody, but I'll check that. Okay. All right. My second question, um, and I guess this is to my colleagues and to uh, Clerk Swope, I have gotten some communications about signing up to speak and that um, depending on how people are watching this, um, depending on whether they understand the methods for signing up, that they might need a little more time and that we might get a few more um, participants if the cutoff was a little bit longer. So I'm wondering if we can, instead of saying until the end of the first person speaking, because they may not even take their first three minutes, can we say the um, six minutes or the end of the first two people speaking, um, whichever is longer, so that we can have the opportunity for the people who are trying to pick the buttons and you know how to dial in and what to press and all that kind of stuff so that they have the time to figure that out. Um, I don't know if that's a rule that, you know, if it's just a policy that we've always, you know, had, but, um, or if it needs to be codified in some way, but I'm just wondering if we could extend the period of time um, after announcement that people can sign up. Um, I'll, I'll jump in as, as the person who watches this. Um, yep. uh, we have announced that deadline and we have always accepted people a bit past that deadline and that deadline also um, does generally include the mayor's comments, which are generally several minutes. Um, so like at a regular council meeting, we set a timer. It's just a little bit difficult with Zoom to set a timer and have somebody be able to see a timer and, and watch a timer. So that's, that's why we have gone with the first speaker because it gives them the full amount of time that the mayor is speaking, questions from council members to the mayor, as well as um, at least the first. 
speaker. And if they do speak less than three minutes, I, I specifically do give more time. So I, I'm open to more discussion, but that, that's been my process. Could we make sure that we announce several times then the process for signing up the whole, I mean, when you announce it after the mayor's comments, after the first speaker, just to, or before the first speaker, just to make sure that there's enough um, notice for people to figure out how to sign up. Sure, I'll announce it now. <laughs> if you want to sign up um, on a, your um, participant panel, there's a raise hand on a phone, it is star nine. Um, and then in addition on a computer or a, a handheld, in addition to the raise hand icon, you can do alt Y on a Windows computer or option Y on an Apple's computer, on an Apple computer. Um, but both, all, every computer, every platform I've been on, um, except for a telephone, uh, if you can find the participant screen or your own name, there is a raise hand icon somewhere on your screen. If you um, are on any kind of a smartphone or a uh, computer device. And I think that's it. Okay. All right. So again, uh, we will be closing comment, closing sign up after the first speaker finishes. And the first speaker is Loretta Sandway, followed by Ellen. Good evening. A um, couple of things tonight. Uh, the first thing is the rezoning for St. Casimir's for the um, youth center and so forth. I support that. I think that's a wonderful reuse of those buildings. Um, for okay. the West Jolly rezoning. Loretta, can I pause you for one second? Sure. I'm sorry. I, I got um, waylaid and I did not read into the record the two public hearings and we did not have an overview from the council members on this. So we will go back. We'll come back to Loretta. Michelle. We'll come back to Loretta in a moment. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, so the two public hearings uh, that we have tonight are in consideration of SLU 5 of 2020, a special land use permit for 727 Sparrow Avenue to allow for a community center outreach facility and transitional housing shelter in the A residential district. And the, uh, the other public hearing is, is in consideration of Z9 2020, 3534 and 3538 West Jolly Road rezoning from community plan to DM1 residential district. Uh, Councilmember Garza, is there anything you wish to add to those two public hearings? Uh, no, I was just going to give the little high high uh, level summary, but uh, I think you covered that. So no, I'm I'm good. All right, thank you, Mr. Clerk. We're ready to resume. Ms. Sorry, let's go back to Ms. Stanley. Okay, Loretta, and then Ellen. Am I unmuted again? You're back. Okay. All right, to recap, I do support the St. Casimir's changes. I think they're a wonderful reuse of those facilities. I do support the West Jolly Road zoning changes, providing, of course, that there's no tax abatements or brownfields involved. Um, I do not support the social district uh, drinking changes. I think we already serve alcohol in enough different places that we don't need to be adding places who typically are high traffic family and children sites to uh, additionally have more use of alcohol. We don't have to have alcohol everywhere we go and everything we do. Uh, I don't think that the city parks um, should be included in that. Um, there needs to be a few places that people can go with kids and family and not be exposed to potentially drunken or unruly behavior. And then the last is the form-based zoning, which I oppose as I have always opposed uh, for several reasons, including its function, um, its focus is on appearance versus function, which means that we lose control to some extent of how a building is used. It could be built to look like one thing and be used for an entirely different thing. 
Also, there's problems with frontages and setbacks and parking. And as well with uh, renovations, property owners lose some of their flexibility in what they can do to renovate their properties. And in particular, is a concern if there's a, a damaged property like a fire or something like that, the timeline for renovations is, is too tight, especially in these days of COVID when a lot of materials are not available, contractors are not available, et cetera. Um, and I think the zoning districts are too rigid but um, most of all, my biggest concern is that it creates too much of a hom homogeneous uh, appearance. We lose a lot of variety in the styles and materials that can be used to structure new facilities. And I'll tell you what, at 422 pages, this is a bear to try and work through. It would have been very helpful. And if there's any consideration of still doing this, I think it would be extremely helpful if there was a side-by-side -side comparison of the changes and the impacts those changes would make. It would have been a lot easier to try and evaluate this if something like that had been in place. Uh, that takes care of it for me. Okay, thank you. And again, we are about to be stopping and accepting additional raised hands. Um, and we are to Ellen, followed by Kathleen and Julie. All right, thank you very much. Ellen Gallivan, uh, 1712 Beale Avenue. Uh, pertaining to the sale of St. Casimir, I'd like to know if uh, we, we had several things that were good for the community at St. Casimir. I'd like to know if they're going to continue. Uh, first of all, St. Casimir was our polling place. Uh, will that continue? Uh, we had uh, the Southside Community Kitchen had a soup uh, luncheon, uh, had a luncheon Mondays through Thursdays every week. Again, with COVID, of course, that temporarily stopped, but if the restrictions are lifted, would that continue? The uh, Lansing Food Bank came once a month on Saturday afternoons uh, for food distribution. And we had a farmer's market on Thursday afternoons from roughly May to October. And so basically I'd like to know if the sale of St. Kaz to um, the child and family charities uh, proceeds, will those four things uh, continue? That's all. Okay, thank you. Um, and just to note this, we don't generally get into answering questions, although they may be answered later in the meeting. Um, Kathleen Edgerly, followed by Mike Reddy. Kathleen? I just got the on mute. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, good evening, everybody. Uh, I just wanted to speak briefly this evening uh, in support of the ongoing discussion and ordinance discussion taking place surrounding social districts. I believe council has received a couple letters from various property owners and business owners in the downtown district in the past, as well as some more recent letters of support um, as we look at this past year, it definitely has been rough in a number of ways, and social districts are just one way that we can help our small businesses across the city recover, um, and I just would like to be included in others, others who like to be included in ongoing discussions surrounding social districts and where those are located in our city. Thank you, and I yield the rest of my time. All right. Uh, thank you. Next, we have uh, Mike Redding, followed by David Sell. Mike, we can't hear you yet. Is that better? There, now I can hear you. Now you can hear me. Okay, Mike Redding, Churchill Downs, uh, here remotely from Lansing. Uh, my concern is the property rezoning on Jolly. If you look at this property and go out and take a look at it, the concerns that we have as a neighborhood group is the water that is being shed by these properties. Right now, the one next to where to the um, east of where they want to put these apartments is concrete from Jolly to the fence line. 
and it is raised above the water table in that area. And they push all their snow off and it, it goes down into the property is behind where the apartments are that they wanna put in, which is wetland. It's trees, it's all low lying land and it just holds the water, the mosquitoes, all the critters that are in there involved with it. And if you add more apartments back there, they're gonna drive that concrete back further and lift it higher. And it creates just such a huge low spot in here. These, the neighbors can't enjoy their backyards. We got flooding um, and the grass stays wet, you know, for four months out of the year and more in the, um, later in the spring when we get late rains, but, there's no water to go anywhere. We can't enjoy the backyards. Um, again, I said the snow gets pushed off, water flows already into the wooded area because the drain that is in the property that is on the east of that, they did put a drain in, but again, that drain is elevated probably six feet higher than it should be because it's on top of the concrete that they paved all the way to the fence line. Um, the new build is not going to help us in that area because even if they take it to the fence and build up, it's still going to create a low spot for the water to go around those two parking lots. And it also comes in from the west already because that's just a low lying area to begin with. So I would strongly recommend that you guys do not allow this to be rezoned. Not unless you put some serious effort into creating some way of draining water away from there. I'm not an engineer, but I can stand in that parking lot and I can tell you what needs to be done and what was done wrong when they put it in to start with. So otherwise, you're just ruining the property values. And if it starts there, it gets to my house in two more blocks. And I'm not going to be happy about that. Thank you very much. I yield my time. Thank you. Um, next, we have Dave Sell followed by Sam Cho. Hello, verifying that you can hear me. I can hear you. Excellent. Uh, David Sell, managing partner with The Exchange, The Loft of Lansing, Tin Can Downtown, Tin Can Tap Room, and other assorted uh, entertainment venues downtown. Thanks, Council, for hearing from us tonight. I'm here to voice my strong uh, support for the social districts in the downtown area. Um, I have, uh, I'm also with the endorsement of our 30 staff members that we will bring back very soon, as soon as we're able to open uh, until midnight. And in our heyday, we had about 50 employees, most of which are downtown Lansing residents. I have businesses, tin cans that I own in Kalamazoo, in Grand Rapids, and in Toledo. All three of those downtown districts have social district, uh, social district programs there. They've been wildly successful for us in those uh, areas. They make the downtown areas uh, desirable, vibrant, exciting, and, and to that and more exciting than a, maybe a neighboring downtown area somewhere else. So uh, we have people walking from our venue to the stadium to catch a concert or a ball game, et cetera. They've just been very, very good for us with very few problems. I initially envisioned we may have some sort of issues. We've seen very few of them um, and they've just been very, very good for us. It's been a tough, tough year for us bar owners. And this is just kind of one little, uh, this is one of the things that can put us over the top. You know, there's been a lot of bars in Lansing and around the corner and restaurants that have come and gone. We have persevered, uh, but it's been tough. This is the toughest that I remember. And I've been down here for 15 years. So this would really help us. I did hear from one resident earlier that was concerned about alcohol everywhere and in parks and such. I can tell you that in our other districts, they're concentrated to a very um, small business area, centered area. I don't know of any parks in the downtown Lansing area that I think would be affected by this. Uh, and it's just been very good for us. So again, my strong support, I would avail myself at any time to answer questions for the council should they have any questions for a business owner that has been involved in these. I think we've been five years now in Toledo with it and a couple of years in the other venues. So uh, I yield my time, thank you. Thank you. Um, next we have Sam Cho followed by Marilyn Rogers. Uh, good evening, uh, everyone. Uh, just hopping on the bandwagon of people talking about the uh, social districting and, and public consumption areas. Uh, I'd like to be a proponent of it. Uh, number one, uh, because the punitive and, and taboo culture that exists in many municipal governments, uh, statistically speaking, uh, social psychologists say that that contributes to recidivism in alcohol. Americans have the highest 
rate of alcoholism in the world. And it's not because we like drinking more. It's because that it's it's seen as some sort of secret or or dirty or or scary thing, right? Uh, and and so I think that uh, you know limited public consumption uh, does. Uh, go a long ways in undoing that stigma. Uh, I also believe that studies show that crime rates uh, related to alcohol, uh, related to violent crime, related to intoxication, uh, don't have significant uh, collateral rises, right? Um, and then the, the other item that I would like to point out is it is part of uh, the consent agenda on number four, the amendment to committee assignments. Uh, I would like to point out that it would still be a very bad idea to undo the, the censure that was given to councilperson Betts um, for, for a variety of reasons. Uh, other council people have public outreach. They speak to their constituents uh, and and he has not done that. There's been one Mr. public Mr. meeting that, aware of, uh, that he left. Sam? Yes. Sorry to interrupt. That's actually not on this evening's agenda. There's just a resolution creating a, an ad hoc committee for consent tonight. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. Okay, uh, next we have Marilyn Rogers, followed by the advocate uh, Michael Lynn Jr. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Um, to Marilyn Rogers, I want to say hello to the uh, council members and the uh, mayor. Thank you for allowing us to uh, address the issues of this evening. My issue of concern is the uh, rezoning of the uh, Z9 2020, 3534 and 3538 West Jolly Road. Um, that property backs up to my backyard. The statements that have been made by um, Mike Redding of the Churchill Downs Neighborhood Association, I concur, I oppose. Uh, you know, I do not support the uh, rezoning of the property for the uh, statements that he has issued. I personally uh, can see the property uh, from my backyard. My backyard is not usable. Um, the, the surface water runs off and there's literally a, a pond or a lake for most of the seasons out, out of the year and it's, it's not usable. Um, so again, uh, Mike pretty much stated, I think the uh, facts of the neighbors, uh, my adjoining neighbors and I uh, are the recipients of all the water runoff uh, in the back of our backyards, and we're not happy about it. Um, it's, it's terrible not to be able to use your backyard. And uh, so I just like to go on record and, and state that I do oppose that because it um, certainly makes our uh, livelihood and our property values as well as the livelihood of using our backyards just um, impossible. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, we have Michael Lynn Jr. followed by Abby Schwartz. Appreciate it. Um, I just wanted to come on and speak on a couple of the ordinance for pastors today. Amendment, amend chapter 240 to restructure the grant and warning process for basic human services. Um, I'm concerned about some wording in there and, I, and I'm not necessarily totally against it. And I just kind of want to go on record to these facts before it happens that I can say I, I told y'all so. Uh, some wording in that one, as well as the amendment to chapter 608, uh, which is the consumption of alcohol beverages and public property. Uh, both of those issues and both of those things seem very uh, equitable in ways and very unequitable in others. And the main reason why I believe it's very unequitable is that um, a lot of the onus falls on this current mayor uh, who has had a lot of issues with transparency and backroom deals being the final say in a lot of these issues, uh, given the fact that uh, Rotor Park was not included in this process of how people can um, rent that space in order to, to have an alcohol uh, permit or a, a beverage permit. Uh, it, to me, it speaks volumes that that was what that's meant for there. And it's going to be abused in the aspect that uh, that will be allowed uh, for the mayor to make that decision on whether or not anybody gets that. If I'm completely off base, you tell me. But the way I read it, uh, the mayor's uh, the mayor's. Um, uh, got the last word and the last say in that aspect. And as well as the chapter amendment for 240, um, as, I, as I recall, or as I've been told and as I've researched, this has been in place for uh, over 30 years, I believe it is, this, the current process and was being um, you know, handled possibly inequitable as well. Um, but the new way that this was written seems to be a better process, but in the end, giving that ultimate say so uh, again to a mayor who's shown his propensity not to be transparent 
and work backdoor deals is very concerning to me. So all I would ask is that if the council is going to really uh, consider changing these two ordinances is to take it back to some whatever committee you take it back to and rework that wording uh, so that these things don't fall on this corruption of a mayor that we have here. Uh, so those two things. Um, what else do we have here? I, I think uh, ranked choice voting is up for today. I'm not positive it is, but I definitely support that. I don't know if that was on there or not. Um, and I guess Black Lives Matter. That's all I really had to say. So thank you guys. Thank you. Um, next is Abby Schwartz followed by Linda Appman. Hi, I'm Abby Schwartz. I live in Lansing um, in 118 Shepherd Street. And I wanted to speak in support of the um, proposal to change the charter so that we could have ranked choice voting. Um, I think there are- a lot um, of That's a referral item. Um, so we've spoken about at the second portion. Okay. Okay, thanks. Um, next we have Linda Appling followed by Rosalind Arch. Hello, my name is Linda Appling and I'm gonna go fast because your process is at best confusing in terms of how you get on uh, the, being able to speak. I haven't been able to do it for a number of weeks, but in the first place, uh, I did wanna say something in terms of the proposals that had originally been put forth by uh, Mr. Jackson, and I can't go over them all right now, but one, 656 that deals with the uh, power. Ma'am, th those, those are for the second portion as well. Those are not up for action tonight. Yeah, but I don't know I'll be able to get back on on the second portion. It has been pure hell for me to try to figure this out in terms of being able to access this process. Last week I tried to access it, was totally unable to. I don't know who in the world, I don't even know if I'm on it or not on it until after the end, you don't put up the names. And please stop the clock from going because this is an issue that really pisses me off because I took the time to uh, try and be here on time in terms of the Zoom and the Zoom thing is totally confusing in terms of how you access this. And no, I'm not happy with it. Now, if you can guarantee me that I will be able to get back on then that's fine. But if you can't guarantee me, I wanna continue on with what I have to say. Do you have something to say, Mr. Swoop? Ms. No, Appling, it's, uh, it's the president's meeting. <laughs> yeah, Ms. Appling, because we have asked folks, it would be inequitable if we allowed someone to speak on a non-agenda item at this point in time, but we will we'll work with Mr. Swope at the end of the meeting to make sure that if, you're, if your hand's not up, that we call on you anyway, um, as someone who's expressed interest in this. We did just have a discussion at the Committee of the Whole about trying to bring us back to in-person in some form, so people that were having challenges with Zoom we're able to better access the, the, the committee and the council meetings. Um, I apologize well, that you're having trouble. Well, I'm not happy with that response because I've been trying for about two weeks to get on to say something. Okay, there, and we can also, um, we also can take written comments and we can also um, through no, emails no, no, or no. In, in writing. I don't want to continue on discussing okay. this, but I know you have other people, but okay. the ability to do Thank written comments assumes a lot of technology behind it. Thank you. Appreciate Thank that. Thank you, you Ms. Appling. Our next speaker, our final speaker is Rosalind Arch. Hi, everybody. Um, I might be a bit too early. I'm here to speak on consent agenda item number nine. Oh, you're in the right time. I am, wonderful. Okay, um, well, hello, my name is Rosalind Arch. I'm the director of the Capital Area Response Effort. Um, thank you so much for having me. I just wanted to take a couple minutes to talk about the CARE program and the additional grant money we are awarded by the Victim of Crime Fund this year. Um, first, I'd like to address something that Council Member Woods brought up at the Ways and Means Committee last week. Uh, thank you, Council Member, um, which was that there are some concerns among, among Council Members that by approving the budget increase, Council would be approving funds for police personnel and police programming. But I wanna make really clear that that's not the case. Um, we're really lucky to have a good relationship with the Lansing Police Department and with the five other law enforcement agencies we work with. And I say that because communities in which advocates and police have strong relationships are proven to be communities that are more effective at preventing violence and preventing homicides. Um, but that being said, we are not the police. Um, we're a separate advocacy organization. 
for survivors of domestic violence. So we arrive on scene to meet with survivors after the police have arrested a suspect and left. We do not arrive wearing uniforms or badges. Our staff doesn't have backgrounds in criminal justice and we don't come to interview the survivor about what happened that night. Um, we're there to provide emotional support, um, information on victim rights and to develop a relationship with these survivors so they don't have to go through this process alone. Um, we have complete confidentiality with our clients. We receive referrals from LPD and other police departments, but it's not a two-way street. Um, we don't give any information back to them unless requested by a client. And we don't pressure victims into reporting violence to police or participating in prosecution. Um, we work to make sure that survivors understand their options and can make fully informed decisions about their own lives. Um, we also have a relationship with Sparrow Hospital. So there are times that we're dispatched out by Sparrow to meet with survivors and who never come into contact with the police. Um, our services are available to any and all survivors. So anyone is welcome to call our helpline and um, schedule an appointment with an advocate and they'll receive the exact same services um, that they would were they to be working with the police. Um, so all of that being said, um, we do have other services. We help with per personal protection orders, housing, safety planning. We have a free closet here with um, food provided by the Greater Lansing Food Bank and hygiene items um, and, and clothing, which is available to any survivor, like I said. Um, so yeah, that being said, we worked with over a thousand clients in the year of 2020, just between three full-time advocates here, which is pretty amazing. Um, so yeah, I think this program is super special. Um, I know this is my first time meeting a lot of you, um, but you know, we're the only program in Michigan, the only city in Michigan that does what we do. Um, and it's, it's widely regarded to be best practice in, in the world of domestic violence. So just a little bit about this um, money. One of the things on this amendment is to purchase a vehicle. So that vehicle would be used for our staff to, for example, drive a family of five um, in the middle of the night to a domestic violence shelter with their belongings. Um, there's money on there for direct financial assistance, assistance for victims to relocate, relocate to safe locations and the translation of our agency materials into other languages. So thank you all so much for your time. Thank you. Perfect timing on three minutes. Uh, we are to the legislative matters and the referral of the public hearings. Uh, we have SLU 5 of 2020. Uh, Committee on Development and Planning. And Z9 of 2020. Let's do the same one. Okay. Then we are to ordinances for passage. Um, give me one second here. Uh, Uh, we have an ordinance of the city of Lansing, Michigan to amend chapter 240, sections 240.01, 240.02, 240.03, 240.04 of the Lansing codified ordinances to restructure the grant award process for basic human services. The ordinance uh, is read a second time by its title and is on the order of immediate passage. Councilmember Dunbar, your committee. Thank you very much. I would like to take a moment to answer some of the questions that were raised um, as I introduce this. And then um, Council Member Spadafore, I'll have you talk about the changes that you've made um, in greater detail. So what this is, um, this is a, an amendment, a change to the ordinance that dictates basically our HRCS funding. And in the past, we've always had 1.25% of the general fund budget dedicated to um, basic human needs and um, as provided by agencies in the city. Um, one of the changes that's being proposed here is to increase that amount from 1.25 to one percent Three, five, and it doesn't look like in the documents that is, I don't even know how we would say, um, it's not capitalized in such a way as to draw your attention to it, but that is one of the changes. Um, and it's not really introduced in here. Hard as to capitalize numbers. <laughs> yeah, you can't capitalize a number. So I'm just saying that for those who are reading it and looking at the caps as the changes in the document, another significant change is the 1.25 became 1.35. Um, and then also there, this was a big concern for myself when I first saw um, the proposal that city uh, departments would be eligible for this funding because this has been um, 
funding that's been available to community organizations that are doing this work on the ground at the grassroots level in the community. And, um, and so I was hesitant and I was not supportive of that change. But after having the discussion at, in two different committees about this and understanding um, there's only like one department, I believe, that's, that's working with well, two departments that are working with this. Um, but it's funding that's already being used in that way. And they're trying to change the ordinance to actually fit what's being done in practice. So the parks department, for example, uses a very small amount. It's a couple thousand dollars of this as the copay for an AmeriCorps member to work over, I believe, at Baker Denora. Um, that to me is a lot of the agencies in the public are using that money to for the stipend um, or the copay for their AmeriCorps. So it makes sense. It's a grassroots outreach. It's not a stopgap hole in our budget. It's funding something that a nonprofit would have done in the community, but there isn't one working in Baker Denora right now. So um, that actually seemed like a legitimate use of the funding. Um, the process for that has to, they have to go through the same scoring process. If a department wants to use the funds that in any agency outside would have to use, it would still be reviewed by the um, citizens that are on the, uh, they're appointed to the HRCS board. Um, so the review process would be the same for them as any agency. They would be competing in the same way. Um, and I think the one thing that I will add on here, I believe there might be a mistake. Um, and if we've got Lisa Hagen um, or Jim on the line, there is a, there's a section uh, that talks about the, here we go, uh, page three at the top of the document. This is um, 240-203B. It's phrased at least one-tenth of the 1.35% will be allocated as described. And this is, this is what we had decided in committee based on um, President Spadafore's amendment was to increase this amount and use that additional 0.1% dedicated to address, um, to give to agencies that address root causes of racism and or promote racial equity. But by saying, one tenth of the 1.35 percent that's actually wrong so i don't know how to rectify that in this um you guys can figure out the language on that but it's um it came out of law written at least one tenth of the 1.35 and it's really it's one tenth, one tenth of the general fund general fund budget so however that can be fixed um that would be great we'll need a Lisa, if you could uh, send an amendment in writing so we can get the that change, we, we can we can I, we can bypass this and come back. Yeah, to I think if you just strike out of the one point three five percent, should I but specify that it's general fund dollars? Well, yeah. the funds described in section P forty one. Okay, sorry. Wait, wait, oh, just one Chris minute. Is, Chris is probably correct. Just to take out the, uh, just say one tenth of the funds described. Okay. That that's not what we're going for, though. It's it's one tenth of one percent of the general fund budget. So, um, it's the addition. It's the addition between one point two five to one point three five. So I think you need to say one point one zero of the of the GF budget. I mean, technically, it's like seven point four percent of the one point three five. Yeah. But I don't want to know. I get, like the math nerd in me is like that's too wordy. And while Lisa is figuring out how to phrase that, um, Peter, would you like to, council member, council president Spadafore, would you like to address why that change is in there? Sure. Um, Can so I make sure we're understanding, Mr. President, that you're talking uh, in that section about one tenth of 1% of the general fund dollars allocated pursuant to this ordinance? No. No. Okay. It's it's one tenth of 1% of the general fund budget. So we've moved the total HRCS allocation from 1.25% to 1.35%. The increase in that, that one tenth of 1% increase, so all of that money um, shall be, at least that shall be reserved for 
um, organizations and uh, activities that address the root causes of racism in Lansing and or promote racial equity. Lisa, do you have that to be able to put that in a change to the ordinance? Yes, I'm looking at the draft right now. I think the way to do it is just to say at least one tenth of the general fund dollars uh, allocated in section 240.03a. I don't that... think so. I think that that over allocates because uh, that would be one tenth of 1.35%. I think you need to say of the general fund. You could also say it as the difference between 1.25 and 1.35 shall be dedicated to. And then in the future will confuse some scholars who are wondering why it says 1.25 to begin with, but it does accomplish our task. Yeah, we can do that. <laughs> okay. That's, that, that's the will of the council. Yeah, we can it, that. It's clean, it, it, it makes sense. Whatever, the, 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 the point is it's one tenth of 1% of the entire general fund, which is the difference between 1.25% and 1.35% of the entire general fund. Or you can do it that way, either way. Yeah, one tenth of the entire general fund. Well, I think Lisa's clear now what we're looking for. So we'll just need it in writing so we can we can amend okay. it. But I'll walk through, I think we've, we've, we've talked about the changes in this ordinance a lot about the, the, the change in process, the internal auditor being involved, the scoring matrix, the signing of conflict of interest forms, those types of things. A few changes that we made coming out of committee um, involved. First at the top um, of this, this uh, item, which is page one, um, expanding, I'm sorry, page two, uh, expanded the definition to include addressing the root causes of racism in Lansing and or promoting racial equity. This is directly from the um, resolution that this body passed, declaring racism a public health crisis. This is uh, one way that we, you know, in a in an in a organization like the like the city, you speak through your budget in terms of priorities. This is one way to say this is something that we're prioritizing in the allocation of these dollars. Um, and one of the reasons I wanted to make sure that, or the committee rather, wanted to make sure that we raised the allocation was that we didn't want to necessarily. Um, start harming other outside agencies that have been very beneficial for homelessness, for all that type, for all the types of activities that we've been using these dollars for in the past. So what this does is raise the amount that is dedicated to these services by one tenth of one percent of the general fund, and then at least guarantees that organizations that that uh, promote racial equity and address uh, systemic uh, racism in our community get those dollars, and that means that we have to come up with them from uh, from the general fund. And we, we, we talked about that a lot um, in the committee, um, which originally the proposal was a little higher, a little, a little more phased in, but this is a, um, a compromise that we think we can, we can it's, it's, it's a dedicated amount of revenue for, from the city budget for those purposes. So that's the, that's the biggest change, I think. The other change that, um, that we put in was that each organization that um, applies for these grants must certify and attest in addition to their conflict of interest forms that they are familiar with and can adhere to the city's human rights ordinance. Um, something that was important um, when we had discussions over the last couple of budget cycles about these, these grants being awarded. And then um, one thing that we, we put in there was uh, that the internal auditor shall be a part of the initial review of these contracts, not may. Um, we wanted to ensure that the city's internal auditor was guaranteed to be part of this process rather than just suggested to be part of this process. Um, so I think those are the, the major points, council member number, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I think those are the major ones. And I would just say that from the math that we did based on this year's current budget, that additional 0.10% came out to about $140,000. So we're talking about an additional $140,000 added to the HRCS allocation and that segregated amount um, being recommended that at least that amount be used for um, programming that addresses um, racial equity and social equity. So I think, I think you covered it um, very well. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Councilmember Number. Councilmember Wood has her hand up. <clears throat> Um, I'm going to be asking the council to um, recuse me uh, from this vote. Um, the agency that I work for applies um, for these grant dollars. 
um, also um, in applying for state and federal dollars, um, I show that I've received um, dollars through the city, the state and federal dollars help pay my salary. So part of getting that is showing that we're working with other agency, with other municipalities. So this does have a direct benefit on um, my own salary. So, I, so I'm asking to be recused from this vote. Okay. Um, where are we right now? We haven't even had a motion yet, correct? Okay. Lisa, I just got your amendment. You struck out the, the language about the general fund, so we need to try one more time. It, so. <laughs> I mean, five minutes, I'm sorry. That's all right, no worries. Thank you for your for your speed on this. Um, so why don't we, we'll put a pin in this one and we'll, we'll move on to the next one and we'll come back to this, if that's all right, while we wait for the amendment and then Councilmember Wood, we will note your, your request for recusal vote when we get to the motion and we'll just, okay. we'll do that quickly. Um, could, I, so, could I add one more thing? Yep. Um, um, the none of these dollars are allocated without uh, community engagement. And I, I wanna make that clear for anybody that's new to this process who has never gone through it before, both myself and council member would have, because I my organization used to receive funding in the past, but at the beginning of the grant cycle, there's always a community engagement with interested um, partners who want to apply for the funds to talk about gaps in services and what's most needed in the community at the time. Um, and and it's, a, it's an engagement. And so I, I think that there were some folks that were worried that, um, that there wasn't a possibility for the community to sort of have a, a say in how these funds are allocated. And there is um, at the beginning of the granting process. So I just, I wanted to let everybody know that. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, so we don't uh, uh, put uh, poor Lisa uh, in, under too much duress. We're gonna move on to the next item and then we'll come back to this and, and vote on it. So thank you, Lisa, for working quickly on that. Mr. Clerk, if we could move on to item five. What you got, um, yeah, you go. <laughs> we have an ordinance of the city of Lansing, Michigan to amend the Lansing codified ordinances by amending chapter 608, section 608.04 to allow for consumption of alcoholic beverages on public property located in social districts established in conformity with state liquor control laws and at South Washington office complex is read a second time by its title. The ordinance was reported from the committee on city operations and is on the upper immediate passage. Council member Dunbar. Okay. Still on. Okay. Um, this, this ordinance is to establish the districts, to establish our ability to have the districts. Um, it doesn't necessarily establish where those districts will be um, as far as the, the public use for restaurants and bars and things in, in certain areas of the town. So I wanted to make that clear. Um, that will have to come back to us. We also um, added in here because one of the reasons that this was proposed uh, was one, to address the need to accommodate businesses uh, who are losing money during this pandemic and, and create spaces for them to have outdoor seating. Um, and also it's, it's, it's a, these are great districts for promoting downtown areas in general. Um, but the other reason that we had originally looked at this and we kind of scaled back was to increase the number of venues um, within the city, and some of them were parks, uh, to address uh, places that where people rent the pavilion for a wedding or they rent it for a family reunion or something like that, and to allow them to have alcohol um, in those spaces. Now, we have pulled back out of that the pavilion concept because there were justifiably so concerns that um, like Baker Denora Park has a pavilion. Now it's not rented for weddings or anything like that, but the possibility could have existed that that would have been problematic. So we pulled that out. Um, but eventually, you know, we're going to revisit this in a different way. Um, for now, we added, this was my personal preference, uh, to put back in the SWAC because that has been definitely an area that we have rented out. It's not some place that children go to without their parents for an event. 
We've had many fundraising uh, requests for this space, uh, et cetera, that would definitely um, have, have gone through if we had allowed alcohol there. I would also even move to amend this, and I know that I have to do the formal introduction first, to add Francis Park back in there. Because even the folks in that neighborhood um, recognize that that is a venue that, that, especially inside the covered pavilion, is used for many weddings and other special events that, that would benefit from having um, an alcohol consumption there. And it's really important to point out that this is not, it doesn't just grant alcohol consumption can be done at any given time. Um, there is a permit that has to be applied for. There is insurance. There is a special event application that has to be filled out and approved of in all and in, in many ways um, in order to in order to have the alcoholic consumption in those places. So I think I've rambled around this enough, but um, the districts are the main part. And then I would like to note that we've added the South Washington office complex. And then when I'm done with this, I wanna do a friendly amendment. <laughs> Maybe I can't do it to myself, <laughs> announce that, to add Francis Park back in there. Okay, um, I, you have a motion on the table for the approval of the, um, the, the ordinance that came out of committee. Yes. Um, is there a discussion on that before we start talking about possible friend, possible amendments, excuse me. All right, so I, I will, I would like to say, I'm sorry, council member, go ahead. Um, you know, we went through this discussion with a SWAT building um, sometime, well, wasn't all that long ago. Um, where there was a lot of concern from the public about having um, alcohol at that venue. Um, I definitely support the social districts um, for the businesses in the community. And if that were the only thing that would be on the table, I would be supporting uh, this ordinance. But with the SWAT uh, building, um, the South Washington complex as part of this, I, I won't be supporting it. And if we're talking about amendments, my amendment would be that that, that portion be removed um, from the ordinance. Okay, well, uh, thank you, Councilmember Wood. Councilmember Hussein. Yeah, first I wanna say um, thank you to the committee and the work uh, that was done. Um, I thought it was a, a responsive process. Uh, there was a lot of uh, you know, when we got, we got emails, we got calls, um, you know, we attended neighborhood meetings virtually and, and, and got feedback on this. And there was a lot of concern regarding um, the, the parks and pavilions piece. Um, and there was also concern, candidly, um, regarding the city facility piece um, outside of the parks and pavilions. Um, I would, because I think it's so incredibly important um, to move um, this forward and to allow for the social districts, I would um, also ask um, that we amend this to take out SWAC at this time. I think we can certainly move forward with a more, I don't wanna say comprehensive uh, conversation, but an additional conversation at another time regarding um, you know, city facilities and, and things of that nature. Uh, but our businesses um, are, are asking for this. Um, I think um, they've waited long enough uh, and, I, and I really think we need to move forward with the social district, uh, districting piece. Um, and so uh, you know, as, as an effort um, to not see this thing fail on the floor, I would, I would really appreciate if we would uh, amend and take that piece out. Okay, uh, I'm going to enforce my rules with everybody. Um, all amendments shall become in the written form. So if you've got um, even write down strike line blank line blank, send that to the council so that I can project it on the screen. But I'm not uh, I'm not going to do the work for y'all. <laughs> so um, I've here I've heard three folks with with suggested amendments. So we can put this one on hold and move to uh, form based code. That one should be easy. Um, I see Councilmember Wood. Yeah, since um, Councilmember Hussein, since you and I both have the same one, would you like to send that one on so we're both not sending it? Yep, I can, I can work on it. Thank you. Okay, uh, actually, good news. Uh, I've got the draft from Lisa so we can go back on the agenda. Um, Councilmember Dunbar, would you please withdraw your motion? I withdraw my motion. Thank you. Now, would you uh, make your motion on chapter 240? I remake my motion on chapter 240. 
All right, Mr. Clerk, it is my understanding you've already read it for a second time, so you need not go through that reading of the title again. Correct. But okay. I, do not, I, do, I do not have the amendment. Back. I do, so I'll, I'll broadcast it. Well, I can you email it to me as well? Yes, uh, Sherry, I mean, could you email I knew, the clerk? Right. Yeah, yeah, please email the clerk the document he has to keep a record of. Okay, uh, here is the, the nuts and bolts here. At least the difference in funds allocated at 1.25% of general fund dollars and funds allocated at 1.35% of general fund dollars described in section 240 shall be reserved for local agencies or activities that address the root causes of racism and or promote racial equity. And then the rest of it is the same. There was one um, change that was also added um, in, Lisa, help me out here. This section here, we added our other city departments. Um, that is- That one was already there. Oh, I'm sorry to one. interrupt. If you go up, uh, oh. Council President, to um, 240.03 sub C. Here. Um, so in prior drafts, the words to other city departments was crossed out, but that was when we were taking out all of the references to other city departments. And given the conversation that um, was had at committee that should have been put back in. That was a drafting error, not a not an intentional um, strikeout. So I'm, I asked Lisa to make that change as well because that was the discussions of the committee and the discussions that council reflected in that change. So this change here is the substantive one. This change here is the drafting one. All right, so I'm going to move the substitute. Uh, wait, yeah, right. Yes, I'm gonna move the substitute. Uh, so I'm gonna call a roll on moving the substitute, getting the substitute in front of us. Okay. Mr. President. Yes, ma'am. I've asked to be recused, so I- Oh yeah, on, on the adoption of the, on, on moving of the substitute? Yes. You okay. Uh, Mr. Asked. President, here's the way this works. So first of all, if there's a conflict of interest raised under the charter, mm -hmm. Requires two thirds of those serving. Yep. And then the, if it is granted by council, then it's a majority of those that are left. Okay. Uh, I question whether there is a, a conflict of interest question right now, because uh, council member Woods uh, entity is not receiving direct dollars at this point. Perhaps this should be based at appropriation time. No, we are. I am receiving direct dollars right now. No, but I mean, under this ordinance, you're not. It's not, the ordinance itself is you're not receiving them under this ordinance. You received them on our previous ordinance, yeah. and this ordinance doesn't make any appropriations. I think is what Mr. Smirk has pointed. Yes, That's, she has been. Councilmember Wood has asked for a recusal, yes. so we will yes. we will call a roll on the recusal of Councilmember Wood from the vote to adopt the substitute. Right. Okay, on recusing Councilmember Wood, Councilmember Jackson. Yes. Um, Councilmember Spadafor. Yes. And Councilmember Wood, is she permitted to vote on this? No. No. Okay. Um, Councilmember Betts. He mouthed yes. We can't hear you, Brandon. Councilmember Betts. He said yes. <laughs> He's nodding yes, thumbs up, mouthing it too. Uh, Councilmember Dunbar. Yes. Councilmember Garza. Yes. Councilmember Hussein. Yes. Uh, six yeas, zero nays. So Councilmember Wood is recused. All right. Uh, now vote on adopting the sub, but not yet approving the sub. Council, Chris, Mr. Schultz. Okay. Councilmember Spadafor. Yes. Councilmember um, Betts. Yes. Councilmember Dunbar. Yes. Councilmember Garza. Yes. Councilmember Hussein. Yes. Councilmember Jackson. Yes. Six days, zero days, the substitute is adopted. Right. Uh, Councilmember Dunbar, would you like to move for passage the substitute? Uh, I will move the substitute. All right. It's been All right. Moved, it's been moved. We need to take a council member. Wood, are you requesting a, a recusal for this vote as well? 
Yes, I am. Okay, Councilmember Wood has requested a recus recusal. Mr. Clerk, would you please call the roll on recusing Councilmember Wood? Um, Councilmember Metz. Okay. Yes. Councilmember Dunbar. Yes. Councilmember Garza. Yes. Councilmember Hussein. Yes. Councilmember Jackson. Yes. Councilmember Spadafore. Yes. 68 zero nays, Councilmember Wood is recused. Mr. Clerk, now on the passage of the ordinance. Okay, on passage, Councilmember Dunbar. Yes. Councilmember Garza. Yes. Councilmember Hussein. Yes. Councilmember Jackson. Yes. Councilmember Spadafore. Yes. Councilmember Betts. Yes. Six Gs, zero nays. The ordinance is adopted. Councilmember Dunbar, would you like immediate effect? Yes. Councilmember Dunbar has requested immediate effect, Mr. Clerk. On immediate effect, Councilmember Garza. Yes. Councilmember Hussein. Yes. Councilmember Jackson. Yes. Councilmember Spadafore. Yep. Councilmember Spet. Spet. Bet. Yes. yes. <laughs> Councilmember Dunbar. Yes. Six Gs, zero nays, media effect is ordered. Thank you very much, folks. Um, which one was that? Oh, uh, the HRCS. Okay. Are you, are folks ready for the social district amendment discussion? Okay. Let's move to. Oh. Nope. Go ahead, Mr. Vice President. I was just going to ask if we could. I am just confirming right now. I think I got it. Uh, I think we got it worked out. Uh, but if we could move to form based code, that'd be fantastic. All right. So um, seven years and one hour and 17 minutes in the making is the uh, adoption of form based code. So, Councilmember Garza, would you care to make a motion? Can I read it in first, please? Oh, no. Yeah, go for it. Okay. Seven years and eight hours. It's, and 20 minutes. It's, <laughs> it's only your rules. Change your rules and I won't. <laughs> Ordinance of the, we have an ordinance of the city of Lansing, Michigan to repeal and replace the existing zoning ordinance and map being part 12, title six of the Lansing codified ordinances in its entirety, except for chapter 1300 marijuana operations with a form based code and zoning map. Hey, uh, I'm sorry, the ordinance is read a second time by its title and is on the order of immediate passage. Thank you, Councilmember Garza. Okay, thank you, Council President. So um, are we going to leave this up for, are we going to have any discussion prior to- Yeah, if you just make the motion, then we can have discussion. Okay, I will make the motion. All right, the ordinance has been moved by Council Member Garza. Um, I'm going to ask, uh, I think I think Brian McGrain is, is, is hanging out with us tonight. Um, Mr. McGrain, could you please address the high level overview of what this is, please? And I know that you've brought, been brought in, so we'll wait just a second. There we go. Uh, sorry, absolutely, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Council President. And um, I believe I have uh, Andy Fito uh, with us as well. Okay. So perhaps if he could be okay. in, in case there are questions. Um, thank you for the opportunity to address you all. Um, we are very, very excited. And uh, uh, Mr. Spadafore, as you noted, it has been approximately seven, if not 70 years in the making for this. Um, as you all recall, a number of years ago, Lansing adopted its first uh, full master plan, its first fully redone master plan in a number of decades. Um, one of the big pieces of that master plan was certainly form-based code. It really was the teeth um, to that master plan. We adopted the master plan. Lots of community input went into that. Um, but really, it again left sort of the tool, the main piece, which is the form-based code, um, sort of on the table. Uh, but I, in my position, we, uh, we began we called form-based book club. We went through these several hundred pages uh, line by line with assistance from legal, with our staff. Um, and really what you have before you today is, again, the implementation tool for the master, uh, master plan. So we're very excited um, about this opportunity. This will be transformative for the city. Um, this is really the first way we'll be doing um, zoning differently in, in many decades, many generations, in fact. And I think, again, this will be a really transformative tool for us to make change go with how the city lives, works, plays, breathes, um, really its form. So we appreciate your bringing this up tonight. We certainly ask for your support and passage and uh, we can take any questions if there are any. Okay, um, 
Thank you very much, Mr. McGrain. Uh, Mr. Fidewa is here now, I think, or no? Yeah. Uh, Mr. Fidewa, if you want to add anything, please feel free to do so now, but do not feel obligated to do so. No, I think Mr. McGrain summed it up perfectly. Thank you very much. Okay, any questions from members of council? Mr. Garza, represent, representative, uh, council member Garza. Thanks, council president. I will lower my hands so no residuals. All right. Um, so I guess my question is uh, with the form based code, is there going to be any negative effects to like any of our anchor businesses here in Lansing, for instance, let's say McLaren or Sparrow or any of their future uh, developments? Andy or Brian? Sure, Mr. President, thank you. Uh, yeah, so what's interesting about this again is that this is really a starting point going forward. And in fact, I believe in the documents we, we listed May 1st as really our transitional place. Um, anything that currently exists is essentially grandfathered in. This really is a change going forward. So anything May 1st onward would be subject to this new uh, set of documents, this new ordinance. Okay, now is let's say you know developments take a long time, you know. So obviously some some developments take you know a year, two years, three years, five years. Now if there's if there's a, a project in place, let's say they they have the prints uh, ready to go, they haven't broke ground yet. This form based code comes in effect. Does that possibly mean that future developments might have to scale back and start reworking uh, their their site plan? Uh, typically, anything that uh, is in progress right now, and in fact, we've discussed as staff, we don't have any awareness of anything that will be coming to us uh, or may significant things. I mean, certainly there are things that are out of piece, but again, May 1st is really our, our, our deadline or our, our transitional place. Um, anything that comes to us prior to May 1st will fall under the current zoning ordinances. So if anybody is mid-project, if they're bringing something to us for site plan review, anything of that nature. Um, if it comes to us before May 1st, uh, it will be under the current regime. Anything again after May 1st will be subject to uh, the form-based code. Thank you. Council member Hussein. Yeah, I'll be brief. Um, I, was, um, I was not going to be supportive. I'll be honest with you. Um, we've taken a look at, um, you know, kind of moving forward on this um, a few different times. Um, and I've, I've always kind of expressed uh, some of my concern. And, and really what I did was I channeled a lot of the concerns I heard from the community, um, you know, to our, our administration, to our economic development and planning director. Um, and, to their, and to their credit, um, they worked hard. They worked hard to get out uh, to the community groups. I know that um, even as early as last week, they were out in front of uh, the Eastside Neighborhood Organization, um, really working to make sure that people understood what this was and what this was not. Um, and then, you know, even if we go further back, um, you know, this is this has been um, changed a bit uh, to reflect some of the concerns um, that came from um, the community. Um, I have been on the, the phone uh, a few different times with um, Brian, um, have been in on a couple different presentations with Andy uh, so that I can uh, better understand it and also so that I can hear from uh, those folks that we represent. Um, moving forward, um, again, I, I think it was a responsive process and I think what we have is a better product now. Um, I am going to be supportive, um, but I did want to um, just express my uh, appreciation uh, for the work that was done. Um, you know, particularly uh, Brian McGrain, his shop, Andy Fed, uh, Fidawa, um, and the rest of the crew. So uh, we appreciate you. Um, I am going to be supportive, um, and I do believe um, the vast majority of the concerns that were brought forth at the you know, myriad of uh, meetings that uh, we discussed this at um, have been addressed. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Councilmember Wood. Uh, thank you, President Spadafore. Um, I've had a number of concerns about form-based um, zoning since this was first brought up some time ago. Um, I do appreciate all the work in the, in the, um, the public um, participation and the things that have gone into this. My concern is, is I wish that this had been done in districts and that we would have adopted this slowly and allowed um, to see where there might be pitfalls or uh, issues with that. And um, because this is um, not being done that way, but it is affecting the whole city um, at this time, I'm not going to be supporting it. 
Um, I, you know, I'm sure this is going through tonight, but um, I just feel that this should have been done um, a district at a time um, to, to see how it would work for our community. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Wood. Um, I will just take a point of privilege here and um, I will be supporting this tonight. And I think uh, Brian McGrain, his shop, Andy Fidoa, everyone over the last three years who've tried to bring me up to speed on what this is and what this isn't, um, I'm still not an expert, um, but I have a better understanding of the direction we're going and how it fits into the vision for the master plan. So I appreciate that. Um, and I just wanna thank you all for that work and effort and the involvement from so many community members. Um, and the feedback we've heard and trying to incorporate that as best you can into the product that sits before us. So with that, I will ask that the clerk please call the roll. Unmute. Got to get my mouse over there first. <laughs> <laughs> Just as an aside, it was 51 weeks ago we went on Zoom. Unrelated. <laughs> Thanks for that. All right. <laughs> We're on the adoption of the ordinance, Councilmember Hussein. Yes. Councilmember Jackson. Yes. Councilmember Spadafor. Yes. Councilmember Wood. No. Councilmember Betts. Yes. Councilmember Dunbar. Yes. Councilmember Garza. Yes. Six yeas, one nay. The ordinance is adopted. Uh, and just to make sure I don't screw this up, zoning ordinances can't have immediate effect, correct? So we're going to move on. All right. <laughs> this has a built in effective date anyway. So very good. May 1. Um, then that takes us back to the other ordinance that I already read into the record. I think if we are ready to go back to um, social districts ordinance. Yes. Uh, so we have social district ordinance in front of us. Oh, well, not in front of us, but to be discussed tonight. Um, Council Member Dunbar, you had the original one in front of us. I have a amendment that I think Vice President Hussein is going to propose as a substitute to be adopted. Right. Um, Can okay. I come? Yes, absolutely. Um, uh, to the city attorney, how many votes does this take to pass? Is it five? I'm assuming maybe just this is a, this is a five vote. Five yeah. vote. Okay. So what I, I remember when we were in committee, um, and I asked I asked you, Adam, if you would support this on the floor um, in the way that without Francis Park, but just with um, the SWAC in there, and um, you had indicated that you could. And so that being said, we have, I believe, the five votes that we need without amendment. Um, so I would ask you to reconsider doing that amendment um, because we have the votes that would swap. Okay, can, I, can I comment very briefly? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Um, I did, right, as part of the committee, and that was on Wednesday. Um, and what I said was, you know, as is, um, I could see myself supporting on the floor. Um, however, and, and I wanted to vote it out of committee so that we could have the conversation. Um, I will tell you that, and, and I do apologize, President Spadafore, I should have had the language written up beforehand. I assume some of the concerns that we heard tonight were going to be addressed um, because I also engaged constituents between Wednesday and Sunday. And there are a lot of concerns that remain. Um, and, and so for that reason, I would be more comfortable supporting an amendment, or I should say an amended ordinance where we take SWAC out. Um, and, and I would, I would just appreciate the opportunity. Um, I truly, you know, we all have our, our, our perspectives in terms of what our uh, positions are, particularly, you know, and, and from a ward position, I really believe it is my job, um, to represent those concerns, um, and those voices that I'm hearing. Um, and, and that's what I'm trying to do. Um, and so again, I would be more comfortable moving forward with an amended ordinance. And I do have that ready for your consideration. Okay, uh, someone want to make a motion. It sounds like, Mr. Vice President, you're going to make a motion to adopt the substitute. I am. I'm going to uh, move that we adopt the substitute that landed in your um, emails uh, just a few minutes ago. 
Okay, so we'll, I'm just going to walk this through this real quick. Uh, this is the substitute. It looks like it strikes out and South Washington on office complex in the title. Site strikes out sale of Washington at the South, South Washington office complex in the places where it is authorized and then continues to do so. It's, the yeah, in presence metaphor, I'm sorry. I, I should have I should have explained. Um, right. you know, the, the bulk of the language is included in those first couple pages. And then um, in pages three on um, everywhere where you see SWOC, S-W-O-C for South Washington, Washington Office Complex, we've simply stricken that language. Yeah. Okay. So that's what's in front of us right now. Any discussion? Council Member Dunbar, looks like you want to say something. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm just really disheartened by this because I, I understand in neighborhood parks not wanting this. Um, but we are losing a, a tremendous amount of potential revenue by folks not wanting to rent that space. And, and, and we've had numbers. And I remember at the time that we did this, it was a couple years ago, where we did a special one night allowance so that Firecracker Foundation could hold their fundraiser there. But they, we all know this, that fundraisers, weddings, special events, they want to be able to serve alcohol. And SWAC in particular is not a place where children can wander in and be exposed to it. It is locked, it is closed, it is only open to somebody who rents the space. And I am, I am frustrated that um, support changed on this one. And I, you know, I, I respect you, Adam, that you went back and talked with constituents, but I just, I don't believe, in this situation, their fear of whatever was going to happen isn't grounded in the reality of, of the, that location. And so um, I feel like we are, we are giving money, we're taking money off the table that we could be earning in a down economy to make that space available with alcohol. And I think it's, uh, you know, I, I don't know, I, I see a pearl clutching, oh my God, alcohol. We, we did this when we when we did the, the thing for celebration down there too, you know, people not wanting alcohol in a movie theater. Well, there's a lot of people that won't go see Shrek for the fourth time unless they have a drink. Um, but that's a different story. Anyway, I'm, I'm disappointed in this and I'm not supportive of the amendment, um, but I will, I will understand if that's the only way that this is gonna pass tonight. Yeah, and I was just gonna remind you. Go ahead, Adam. No, and I was just going to say, um, and you know, you're absolutely entitled, you know, to your opinion and position. I'm, I'm not going to try to convince you either. Um, if the amendment is voted down, um, we'll, you know, we'll vote on uh, the original that came out of committee, um, and and we'll see where it goes. Um, as you stated, you believe the, the support is there, um, so this might be much ado about nothing. We'll see. Okay, I don't know if it helps council, but we did have discussions about moving city council meetings to SWAC, and I'm just. That sweetens the deal. Um, <laughs> all right, so I'm just kidding. For those out there, we wouldn't obviously purchase a liquor license for <laughs> city council meetings. Jim wouldn't let it. Okay, so um, I am going to call the roll on the uh, Hussein substitute. Mr. Clerk, please call the roll. Um, on the substitute, Council Member Jackson. No. Council Member Spadafore. No. Council Member Wood. Yes. Councilmember Betts. No. Councilmember Dunbar. No. Councilmember Garza. Yes. Councilmember Hussein. Yes. Three A's, four nays. The substitute is not adopted, which leaves us with the original committee report. Councilmember Dunbar, would you like to make the motion on the original? I make a motion on the original. All right. I think we've had discussion. I'm not gonna say you can't speak now, but speak now or fair hold your peace. All right, let's call the roll. On the ordinance, council member Spadafore. Yes. Council member Wood. No. Council member Betts. Yes. Council member Dunbar. Yes. Council member Garza. Yes. Council member Hussein. 
I know this is going to be confusing. Let me just explain myself. I think it's that imperative. I was truly hoping that we could vote on the amendment um, and that we could support the social district districting, sorry, um, and, and we could have the, this, this other conversation um, separate. I think it's imperative enough um, to move forward with the social districting um, and I'll reach back out to my constituents and I will look to see if this is something I should move to amend um, in the future to take the SWAC out. Um, so I will be supportive, yes. <laughs> Council Member Jackson. Yes. Six yeas, one nay, your amendment is adopted. Do we need immediate effect? Uh, yes, I would ask for immediate effect from Council Member Dunbar. I move for immediate effect. Very good. Immediate effect has been asked Mr. Clerk. Um, on immediate effect, Council Member Wood. Yes. Council Member Betts. Yes. Council Member Dunbar. Yes. Council Member Garza. Yes. Council Member Hussein. Yes. Council Member Jackson. Yes. Council Member Spadafor. Yeah. What is it? Immediate effect. Yes. Immediate effect. <laughs> yes. Okay. Seven yeas, one nay. Uh, or I'm sorry, seven yeas, zero nay. Seven yeas, zero nays. Immediate <laughs> effect is ordered. And that takes us to the consent agenda. All right, before we move the consent agenda, anyone want something off the consent agenda to discuss, vote on separately, vote against? Seeing none, Mr. Vice President. Sure, um, I so on the consent agenda tonight, sorry, uh, we do have several items. We first have the establishment of the ad hoc committee on audit. Um, we do in fact have a grant application authorization for this is for a Michigan National Resources Trust Fund grant. We have a grant amendment. This is Victims of Crime Act VOCA, uh, Capital Air Response Effort Care Grant. Um, so yeah, with that being said, I would move the consent agenda. All right, motion's been made. It is a non-debatable item. Would the clerk please call the roll? On the consent agenda, Council Member Betts. Yes. Council Member Dunbar. Yes. Council Member Garza. Yes. Council Member Hussein. Yes. Council Member Jackson. Yes. Council Member Spadafore. Yes. Council Member Wood. Yes. Seven yeas, zero nays. The consent agenda is passed. We are to resolutions for action uh, for the um, IAFF Local 421 Collective Bargaining Agreement. Mr. Vice President, you're up. Sure. Um, sorry. Uh, briefly, um, this uh, pertains to, again, this is a CBA. Uh, for um, the uh, local IAFF 421. Um, this is a, um, I'm sorry, this does include three years of wage increases. Um, this is ret retroactive back to 2019. Uh, we're looking at respective raises of 2.5% and 2%. Um, we are moving to a three-year FAC or final average compensation. The multiplier would stay the same, but that will result in savings for the city. Um, there's also a small benefit um, of 1% from years 25 to 30 um, to give some benefit for um, some of our senior um, uh, firefighters and, and, and senior command um, in order to try to, um, uh, you know, get them to stick around um, and, and provide some leadership for uh, some of your younger fire, firefighters. Um, there is also, uh, we, I'm sorry, we're moving uh, to new uh, employees uh, or newly hired employees uh, from uh, retiree healthcare to health saving accounts. Um, we also have a, a wage differential for ambulance um, service uh, that will be increased. Uh, and then the time on time off schedule, uh, we actually had a memorandum, mem sorry, memorandum of understanding uh, that had been approved in the past. Um, and so baked into this uh, is language that reflects that, um, that time on time off schedule um, so that it is actually part of the CBA. Um, there is some language that deals with promotions uh, instead of straight seniority. Um, they are now looking at um, things such as seniority. Um, they're looking at assessments, job performance, um, as well as educational background. Uh, and then also baked into this uh, is a new position for a community resource officer. Uh, this individual, among many things, uh, will be deeply engaged in the recruitment, hopefully of a, um, a, a diverse uh, and, and as much as possible local um, you know, crop of individuals uh, to essentially on board into the fire department. So with that being said, I would move um, the resolution um, of the collective bargaining, bargaining agreement ratification. Thank you. It's been moved and there is discussion from Councilmember Garza. Uh, thank you, Council President. 
I believe that 1% is for the junior firefighters. Uh, what you spoke on, uh, Mr. Hussein, Councilman Hussein. But uh, regardless, I just wanted to uh, commend our hardworking uh, men and women in the fire department. They've been putting themselves, uh, their lives on the line day in, day out. They've been without uh, an expired contract for 616 days. So I'm glad to see this contract finally ratified. And uh, the, uh, the fire department was overwhelmingly supportive of this as well. So I'm looking forward to uh, seeing this pass tonight. Thank you. Council member, uh, what? Uh, thank you, President Spadafore. I see in our attendees that the president of the IEFF is um, on and we wanna thank them for um, the diligent work that they did in uh, working with the administration um, over these long several months in order to get this contract done. So thanks, Dan. Thank you, Councilmember Wood. Um, I too just want to express my thanks to everybody for working hard on this. It's it's been a long time coming, and then COVID hit, and all all the other things that that got us here. So I'm glad we can get a contract in place um, for the the firefighters union. Um, I think we have a motion in front of us properly, and seeing no further discussion, I'll ask that the clerk please call the roll. Okay, on uh, ratification of the contract, Councilmember Dunbar. Yes. Councilmember Garza. Yes. Councilmember Hussein. Yes. Councilmember Jackson. Yes. Councilmember Spadafore. Yes. Councilmember Wood. Yes. Councilmember Betts. Yes. Seven yeas, zero nays. The contract is ratified. And we are to um, speaker registration for public comment on city government related matters now. Um, and once again, uh, most computer or smartphones, uh, there is an icon to raise your hand. So you can raise your hand that way. Um, on a phone, you would dial star nine. On a Windows computer, you can also hit alt Y at the same time. On an Apple computer, you can hit option Y at the same time. And again, we will... Uh, stop accepting raised hands after about the first um, finished speaker. While folks are raising their hands, also we will go through reports of city officers, boards and commissions. Mr. Vice President. Sir, I would make a motion that all items be considered as read in full and that the appropriate referrals be made by you. Proper motion before us, Mr. Clerk, please call the roll. Um, referrals, Council Member Garza. Councilmember yeah. Garza? Yeah. Oh, yeah, sorry. Councilmember Hussein? Yeah. Councilmember Jackson? Yes. Councilmember Spadafore? Yes. Councilmember Wood? Yes. Councilmember Betts? Yes. Councilmember Dunbar? Yes. Seven yeas, zero nays. The referrals are ordered. We have letters from the city clerk regarding marijuana operations, licensing, social equity program update. Place down file. Uh, minutes of boards, commissions, and authorities. Place on file. And the determinations of the elected officers' compensation commission. Uh, place it on file and send it. Do we need that to go to Cal? Yes, please send that to Cal too. Carol's my conscience in the left screen here. <laughs> Uh, we have letters from the mayor regarding the grant application for the MDOT local bridge program. Ways and means. Transfer the Delta Grand drain to the city of Lansing. Uh, city operations. Um, two items for the special assessment for Glenburn Commons. City operations. And the IAFF collective bargaining agreement. Place it on file. We have an item from Councilmember Jackson, uh, City Charter Amendment, ranked choice voting for city elections. Yeah, we'll start there in city operations. Communications and petitions, an affidavit of disclosure from Renee Freeman, HRCS Department. Uh, the Ethics Board. Affidavit of disclosure, David Odom, Lansing Fire Department. The Ethics Board. And affidavit of disclosure, Councilmember Kathy Dunbar. And also the Ethics Board. Communications from Scott Woods. Place on file. Oh, sorry, go ahead. It's okay. 
Place on file. From Rachel Franklin, uh, regarding proposed ordinance of uh, objection to repeals. The Equity, Diversity, Inclusion Committee. And communication from Julia Kramer about defunding the police. Uh, Place on file. And we are to motion of excused absence. Is there a motion to excuse Councilmember Spitzley? So moved. To be moved by Vice President Hussein. Is there, uh, will the clerk please call the roll? Councilmember Hussein. Yes. Councilmember Jackson. Yes. Councilmember Spadafore. Yes. Councilmember Wood. Yes. Councilmember Betts. Yes. Councilmember Dunbar. Yes. Councilmember Carson. Yes. Seven yeas, zero nays. And we're to remarks by council members. President um, Spadafore, before you move on to remarks, the letter from Scott Woods, I believe um, that has to do again with green space for um, to purchase that for to add on to the park. And we've been asking that that uh, the park sport. also go to the park sport. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I thought about that, but I didn't see one that was specifically parks. So thank you. Parks board too, please, Mr. Clerk. All right, council members, any further comment? I do have something. So as we relate to the social districts, um, I know we had a little conversation about this, but the next step is establishing those social districts. And there are organizations and, and businesses and, and uh, folks that have reached out already with ideas about places where a social district makes some sense. I would suggest that you do the same, um, either reach out to your ward representatives or myself, or um, and we can start thinking about places where a social district would make some sense. Generally speaking, uh, there must be at least two um, on-premise uh, distribute uh, retailers, so bars, restaurants, or venues where they serve liquor, alcohol, or beer um, in the social district for it to qualify under state law. There are a few more qualifications, but that'll get the ball rolling for you. Um, so just think about that and reach out to folks, uh, particularly if you're uh, if you are a license holder um, and you're looking for that to be added. It sounds like we had a, a few in mind at public comment this evening, but that's the next step. And the goal is to get it uh, those in place and to the Liquor Tr Control Commission before the weather turns nice to stay. Um, I had someone tell me they're looking forward to they're moving here in April and they're looking forward to the snow being gone. I just said it's not necessarily going to be true. So we could still see that here. But the goal is to have this about time for summer. So um, just please communicate with us if you have an idea about social districts. Um, and I think that's it. Just a reminder to the council, I'm out this week um, on some family time. Um, I don't think I'm going to be missing any meetings, but just in case, as a reminder, if, you, if, there's, if things go crazy, call Vice President who's saying he's in charge. And I think that's it. So, Mr. Clerk, we are, uh, while we prepare for the mayor's comments, just remind folks if you want to speak at public comment, Alt Y on a um, PC, Option Y on a Mac, Star 9 on your telephone, um, and that shall get your hands raised. Um, and then I will note that we do have uh, one person that wants to make comment. Mr. Clerk, make sure that she is called on. She's still here. Okay. Uh, so we're to the mayor's comments. Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Um, I also want to add to thanks to the, the, the folks in the fire department, the firefighters. Um, it was, I'm glad we were able to come to, uh, to a final good resolution on this. I appreciate council members, all of your votes. Uh, I want to recognize uh, Nick Tate in my office who started the, the contract discussions and Elizabeth O'Leary who came in and got the save. Um, it's a baseball reference. Um, but uh, they did a great job. So I wanted to, to thank them. Uh, Councilwoman Dunbar, you had asked about um, the, the Mishta down payment assistance. Mark Lawrence had a chance to, to find that and he emailed us both and I looked at it and it says available to first time home buyers, but that's qualified as uh, someone who has not owned a home in the previous three years. Um, so First time home buyer is in essence, someone who hasn't owned in the last three years. I don't know that it's really first time, but that's what it says on the Mishta website. Um, so I hope that that at least gets you your answer. And, and uh, Mark sent us both the, uh, the link. So you can take a look at that um, and, and review that. So it should have the answers to your questions. Right. Um, the only other thing I wanna add is uh, Kathleen Edgerly being on reminded me, I hope everyone had a chance to come to Winterfest. It was incredible. There were a lot of people downtown, socially distanced. We had ice skating, we had 
ice sculptures. We had um, all kinds of fun. It was a really great activity. I don't think Kathleen's still here, but, um, but I do want to congratulate DLI and, and I hope everybody had a really good time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay, we're to public comment on city government related matters. That's anything related to the operation of the city of Lansing. Um, and again, uh, raise your hand by Alt-Y on Windows, Option-Y on an Apple, Star-9 on a phone, or if you have an icon that says raise hand, you can use that as well. And uh, we will start, uh, we will cut off signing up after the first speaker. We have Verlisha Kelly followed by Linda Eppern. Good evening, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Hi, um, my hand was raised initially regarding the rezoning of the property on um, Jolly, West Jolly Road, the Z9 2020 at um, 3534 and 3538 West Jolly Road. I am very opposed to that. My home sits directly behind that unit that's already established. And there is drainage from that unit um, onto the back of my property. I'm concerned about the value of my property. I'm concerned about any damage that may um, happen with my garage. I do have a garage that, a two car garage has been built and is close to that area. So um, I just wanna voice my opinion that I am against that person being allowed to build another unit um, the drainage is terrible back there in the summertime. And um, I would suggest that he find somewhere else to build. That's not fair for us property owners to have to deal with that. And um, my question also, a question that I do have, was that approved through the city, the type of drainage that he did set up on that property for that complex? This is your time to speak, ma'am. I am speaking. You can't hear me? Yes, yes. Ma'am, the clerk was referring that the city council doesn't typically respond uh, to public comment. Um, this is your opportunity to address us and we listen. Okay, I just, did you just hear me? I just spoke. Yes, yes we did. We, yeah, oh, okay. you, you, okay. you asked a question and we didn't want to. Oh, I see, it. I understand. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Okay, next we have Linda Appling followed by Ash. Hello, for the record, my name is Linda Appling and due to time constraints, I'm only going to respond to two of the issues, two of the proposals put forth by uh, Councilman Jackson. One is in terms of the closed parks and that's 65605, I think it is. Uh, I am aware of the letter that Rachel has responded to this, and I am in full agreement with her assessment regarding that particular matter. I would also point out that the overwhelming majority of people in Leno agree with her. Additionally, I'd like to point out that there has already been one death of a child due to drowning in that particular, in the Grand River. And furthermore, not only that death, but there has been vandalism and property damage with the uh, torched observation platform stairs and dock at Fulton Park. They have burned to the ground. It has not yet been replaced. I think that his proposal would merely make the situation worse in relationship to that. Additionally, in the spring and summer and fall months, the uh, and the playing on the basketball courts, it becomes very noisy. I would also like to respond to his uh, request in terms of 69602 in terms of the repeal of, and that deals with guns. Uh, repeal of this ordinance is absurd. Within the past year, a plot to kidnap and kill our governor came to light too we witnessed our men on the steps of our capital. These people were, had various types of guns. 
machine guns, and etc. And three, an insurrection against the legitimate government occurred on January 6, 2021 of this year. In no way should we forego our ability to control where firearms can be seen. I can only assume if council seriously considers this particular proposal, that city council will allow guns and other weapons into council meetings in relationship to that. The other thing I would like to say, and this goes to our uh, mayor, I'm extremely disappointed in terms of the information given on COVID regarding Eaton County, as there is virtually nothing out there in terms of the uh, boards that you have. And the other thing I'd like to say is in terms of council and Jackson, uh, somebody mentioned your kids. Hey, I think they're cute. And I don't see why you don't have them there. <laughs> Even though I don't agree with your proposals. And that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, next we have Ash followed by Stanley. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, um, I'm speaking today to demand a vote of no confidence for Andy Shore to demand that you, Council Member Betts, resign, to demand a hearing on the Lansing Police Department murder of Anthony Hulon and the brutality committed by those in the department, to demand you shut down the jail and support the resolution to defund the police, to demand that the council do something to force the police officers to wear their masks, and to demand that you help um, Lansing resident Tammy Rose. So even if no confidence vote wouldn't remove Shore, it would signal to the people of the city that this council cares about those he's harmed and may harm in the future. I've said this before and I refuse to allow you to forget, Andy wouldn't dignify the, with interaction the protesting city employees and retirees whose healthcare he stole, but he felt comfortable enough to interact with white supremacists and militia men on the day of the presidential inauguration, calling them peaceful. He refused to give city employees a dignity he afforded to white supremacists. Brandon Betts, <laughs> resign. You can't just come back and act like nothing happened. You are not fit for office. Your comments to Mike Lynn were disturbing, hostile, unhinged, and unbefitting of a leader. With rancor, you slashed away at the ties to the movement for black liberation that you had built. And for what reason? Your own feelings of supremacy. Though I'm sure you no longer believe in the reality of pervasive white supremacy since you've acknowledging, sorry, since acknowledging this reality is apparently no longer convenient for you. You accuse Mr. Lynn of not only trying to fight you physically, but of potentially shooting you. You accuse a black male constituent of potentially shooting you. Again, you accuse a black man of wanting to shoot you. What a way to betray to the public your mind's anti-black internal workings. What malice, absolute bile, resign. Disappointing leaders who call white supremacists peaceful and who harass black activists are only part of Lansing problems, Lansing's problems. Once again, the coroner ruled Anthony Hulon's death a murder. Then officials lied to the people about that for about half a year. Um, Anthony Hulon's murderers are still working in that jail. Known murderers not only kept their job, they faced no legal punishment for what they did. The police brutality on Baker Street happened because you allow murderers to keep their jobs and that makes it clear to their peers that the tactics they use can be continually used without punishment. Those abusive cops have been let, sorry, those abusive cops have been given a paid vacation and were let off the hook for what they did. It is devastating to know that these brutal acts will be repeated by Lansing police again and again and again and again and again and again because you're not doing anything about it, do something. And not only should the murderers of Anthony Hulon be hired and held accountable for what they did, for what the murder that they committed, the jail itself needs to be shut down. Lansing does not need a city jail. You could do something about this if you actually cared enough to take action. And do something about the officers not wearing their masks too. I'm not gonna get into all of that right now, but it's just ridiculous. You let them enforce that and they're not doing it themselves. And additionally, what the city is doing to Tammy Rose is disgusting and you should be ashamed to be a part of a city government that is doing this. Address the city stalling of her paperwork to run out the statute of limitations and help her. And don't get rid of Zoom public speaking when you add back in in-person speaking. Add back the in-person and speaking because that makes the meetings more accessible, but don't get rid of electronic means of speaking up because that would make those meetings inaccessible to those of us that are taking every precaution during this pandemic that is possible. That would look a lot like suppression. Um, so yeah, uh, Brandon Betts, resign. Resign. Why are you still here? We need somebody else. Resign. Thank you. Our next speaker is Loretta Stanaway followed by Max Dunn. Hello. Um, I also want to address Brandon Betts. And uh, to my knowledge, I've seen or heard no public apology from him as yet. I want to remind him as well as the council members of his prior actions. Uh, I think the first thing was when he confronted Sandy Zirkel and made comments that were ageist and biased and actionable, I believe, in terms of discrimination. 
Second was his encouragement uh, for people to riot against the city and the police, which I believe constituted a violation of his oath of office. And then his confrontation with council member Spitzley, which was very confrontational and racist. Um, in all those three cases, uh, he was given grace. And I think that uh, he stretched his limit there with his move to communicate the way he did with Michael Lynn. He has shown a strong pattern of poor judgment. The constitution of his conversation with Michael Lynn on Facebook was egregious and unexcusable and constituted cyberbullying. And I think a violation of the ethics ordinance. So it is past time for Mike, uh, for Brandon Betts uh, to do as he has been requested by many groups, his ward members, citizens, and his own prior supporters, and resign. Thank you. Next, we have Max Donovan, followed by Sam Cho. Uh, hi there, I'm Max Donovan. I've called Lansing my home for 11 uh, years now, uh, going on 11, uh, but you guys know me and know that. Um, I'm here to talk about ranked choice voting, but I, I would like to, to open to, to say Black Lives Matter and uh, we need justice for Anthony Hulam. It's incredibly easy to uh, uh, call out racism when it is mean words from people around you, but it means nothing unless you're willing to act on the explicit and direct acts of violence that are committed against Black people in uh, the city of Lansing today. You have the power to do that. We need you to do that. And every moment that you don't is disgraceful. Uh, with that said, I, I would like to move to what I came here to talk about, which is ranked choice voting. I've spoken to you guys uh, a few times before on this matter. Uh, you know that it's important to me. I know that you've received a number of emails on the subject from uh, folks who live in Lansing and folks who have family in Lansing. Uh, I believe we had constituents from every one of your uh, wards who sent emails in. Um, this is something that has been used not just across the country, not just in Maine, not just in Utah, uh, not just in dozens of cities uh, around America, but right here in Michigan, East Point used ranked choice voting uh, in the pursuit of justice to, to create a, a more representative and more democratic uh, uh, council. And they saw some success with that. Um, we, we are not the only city looking at this. I've been asked to, to draft language for East Lansing, uh, the same as I draft, drafted the language that became the, the, the bill that uh, you guys uh, have available to consider now. Um, Ann Arbor uh, is considering a charter amendment themselves. We have one chance to lead and time is running out to do so. Uh, it, it is so critically important that uh, in this time of, of doubt in our democratic systems and of, of skepticism of the uh, mechanisms by which we vote, that uh, new technologies that, that bring more people in, that make our political systems more civil and encourage uh, collaboration between electeds uh, is, is what we do. And that's, that is what ranked choice voting accomplishes. Uh, I, I'll, I'll be here to speak on it every month and I'll continue to blow up your emails on, until we get a vote because that is all that we are asking for is, is the opportunity for folks here in Lansing to vote. We, we just want a chance to, to have our say on, on whether or not the charter should reflect this. Um, while, while you may have your individual opinions about RCV yourselves, I, I don't think any of you should disagree with, with uh, the right of Lansing citizens to have a say in this. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Sam Cho followed by Michigan Poor People's Campaign, which I think is Tobias. It is. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I want to start off by saying that Lansing is not uh, as big of a community as we might all want or think that it is. Uh, Kathy and Carol here in City Council and Andy and Peter in other instances have been my representation uh, at various levels of government or in the school board since I was a, a wee lad. Uh, and so I, I think it's important to, to lean into these connections, to lean into this, this intimacy that, that we have with one another. Uh, I, I think that the 
in general, when it comes to public comment, the level of detachment uh, and body language that, that happens across the screen uh, is a little bit disconcerting. Uh, but more importantly, um, I'm really happy to be able to address Councilperson Betts directly. Last time we, anyone saw him in a group was February 28th, and he had a speech prepared. And the speech was condescending. It was full of partial truths. And it ended with Betts leaving the Zoom call without answering questions or listening to constituents that wanted to speak to him after it was made clear that people wanted to speak to him and ask him questions. I think this is the height of arrogance. Uh, it's the height of demagoguery. And it's coming from a man that is literally too insolent to try better. This is not a partisan issue. Uh, Brandon is simply acting undemocratically and hiding from communication to and with the people of Lansing that got him elected. Uh, he's only here for the seat and the paycheck. He doesn't want the bylaw, the bylaw process of forfeiture to happen. I'd be hard pressed to find a section of individuals or other actors that have any good faith in interacting with Betts because constituents see him for what he is, a coward. He's a thief of tax dollars for a job that he hasn't been doing and he's a losing bet. Anyone, any group with any desire to be successful in policy change in Lansing knows that Brandon is no longer a viable path. And because of this, Brandon cannot do the bare requirements of his job as city council person. Uh, council member Spitzley said that he's lost public trust. And I think that's a great quote. Because of this lack of trust and the absolute paltry efforts to regain any of it and the act of censure by this body, he's incapable of functioning in government. Uh, but the bylaws allow him to scrape and eke pass and allow him to continue theft of tax dollars so long as he appears in Zoom calls and turns off his camera for half of it. That's unacceptable. I would expect one of the other members of this body to be exploring another legal avenue to force a dead horse out of the zoo so that Lansing's constituents have a viable participatory, participatory option in democracy. And I understand that it's a partisan politics issue. People are worried that it could shift the Republican Democratic sway of, of the city government. Uh, but firstly, Lansing residents of the first ward pr would probably demand representation on their terms and not on political terms. And secondly, uh, Councilperson Betts has a majority of his, uh, for the majority of his adult life, has worked with Republicans. Uh, so the Democratic contingent of council has nothing to fear, except for perhaps a replacement that is more honest with themselves and with others about their auspices. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Tobias Webb. Okay. Um, yep, Metro, Lan Metro Lansing, Poor People's Campaign, represent Tobias Webb here once again. Um, I, I want to add on to what Sam said about uh, public comment um, and the lack of you know, accountability for y'all actually hearing what the public has to say. Um, there hasn't been an avenue to um, hold you guys to answer any questions um, in a long time. And it's just getting increasingly frustrating, as well as the fact that here we are, the first public comment where we can really talk about the issues of, in Lansing pertaining to us isn't until nine o'clock, sometimes as late as 11 o'clock every other Monday. Um, so that's that's frustrating for the poor people's campaign who wants to show up and wants to improve the city and be a part of a you know collaborative movement to make the city better. I don't want to have to come on here every other week with a bunch of vitriol for each and every one of you. Um, but you know I do as long as you aren't um, hearing us and you're not moving forward on some of the things we're coming to you with. Um, the, the Porter, the people living in the Porter apartments are still dealing with those same issues, the bed bugs and stuff. Um, and I'm seeing the pictures of that. Pastor DJ Knox is seeing the pictures of that and, and, you know, dealing with some of the secondhand trauma of, uh, seeing all these issues, the, the, the rats and, and, and being the people on the ground interacting with people that are being left behind by the city, um, so yeah, some, something needs to be done with that. Your inspectors are not doing their job adequately. Whatever code they're adhering to is not stringent enough to keep the people of Lansing safe. Um, the other thing is uh, police need to be made more accountable in some tangible way. Our commissioners shouldn't be just beholden to Andy Shore. I can't say how many times I've come on here to ask you guys to get between Andy Shore, um, who, is, who has proven uh, to be 
uh, to, to act in white supremacist ways within our city. Um, and the, the police commissioners um, are, are just reporting to him. They should be uh, beholden to the communities uh, of Lansing. Um, the city jail should not be existent anymore. Um, it's not been necessary. Um, the murder of Anthony Hulon. Uh, I've come to you guys about this and gotten nothing back. Again, I don't want to have to come to and be mad at y'all. I will, you know, Brandon Betts, you got to go. I'm, I'm definitely mad at you. I haven't seen you in a long time. I'm not, not happy that you're here. Um, but yeah, Thank so you. do better y'all. You Thank know. you. Uh, next we have Kelsey Brianne followed by Ethan Schmidt. Hey everyone, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, sorry, one second. I didn't hear my name called off earlier, so apologize. Um, hello, I'm speaking tonight as a citizen of Lansing and a woman of God with a calling on my life to be an advocate. I want to speak of the censure of council member Betts. Um, the actions and inactions of council member Brendan Betts really concern me. As a survivor of emotional abuse, I'm sorry, just one second. A, a survivor of emotional abuse I recognize the clear signs of abuse in his text exchange with Mike Glenn Jr. And the statements and excuses he has made are nothing short of abusive. The sheer amount of gaslighting he used to cover his tracks is an example of white privilege and overt racism, something he claims to rail against. Performative activism is something advocates fear the most. Most of us who are fellow advocates make public comments often say, after our comments that we are left shaking. I am shaking tonight but I feel more empowered to speak my story and hope that you all listen to learn that Betts has shown that he, does, he should not be trusted or given power to make decisions because he's not safe and needs to do the internal work to get help nudging himself. And in my opinion, that needs to happen when he is not in a position of power. And to every survivor of abuse who is listening right now, that, that if this kind of language is ever used against you, it was never deserved, you're worthy of boundaries and support. All of that being said, Black Lives Matter, wear a mask, defund and divest the police, especially now seeing that they sick a dog on a man who was laying on his back and never presented a threat whatsoever on November 13th of 2020. The quit of the officers who beat a man on Baker Street and my friend videoed that and now has PTSD. Justice for Anthony Helon, his family who has fought tirelessly to get answers. A vote of no confidence in Amy Shore, see the door, read the room, time for Betts and Shore to resign. And happy International Women's Day. That's it. Thank you. Next we have Ethan Schmidt followed by Joe Darby. Hello everybody, thank you for allowing me to speak today. Um, I want to point out something that has not been brought up yet, which was yet another extremely disturbing post by the police department. Um, this time expressing support for the thin blue line, which anybody who's paying attention will know is an extremely racist movement um, and a movement that has been, has been around some of the worst actions across the country. Um, I refuse to believe that the police department did not know what it was doing and that the police department does not know how fraught the symbolism is behind that work. The police department has continually been under fire for its policies. So you can't tell me that somebody isn't watching what they do and what they post. And I think the reason that they continue to be so cavalier about these actions is because they don't hear anything from the people who are in charge. Um, they don't hear any sort of accountability and the message is pretty clear. I mean, we, I could talk about Anthony Hulon, but it's been brought up many times. Um, we can bring up how Daryl Green uh, has essentially kicked Michael Lynn out despite having reasons that I don't think were remotely acceptable to do so. Um, but that's also been brought up. But I think the fact that they just continue to post again, they just posted what is, on, what is objectively racist, you know, racist symbolism and again, there's nothing done about it and they'll continue to do so. And I want to warn you that this does not get better. Um, this has not gotten better at all. And I encourage you to step in before it continues to get worse because 
um, I'm deeply concerned that the police department continues to act like this and that there continues to be complete silence from those supposed to be holding them accountable. Thank you for allowing me to speak today. Thank you. Next, we have Joe Darby, followed by Michael Lynn Jr. Joe, you're muted. Joe? Uh, Joe, we can't hear you. You have to hit unmute if you're speaking. I pushed the ask to unmute button, but I'm possible too. Joe walked away. Well, we will see if we come back. All right, well, let's move on to Michael Lynn Jr. followed by Eric Lynn. He just re-raised his hand, so I don't know. He must he must be trying. I can leave him in the the capability and then bring okay. Mike. So, okay. Great. Yep, thanks. Thank you for allowing me to speak for about the umpteenth time um, over the last year. Um, I want to bring up a couple points that I think are, are, are important. Uh, first of all, with the redistricting of the uh, drinking ordinance or whatever the case is, my concern is the equitable way that you all will present and allow people to use those um, uh, those permits. That's really my only concern. I don't have a problem with you guys allowing people to drink in public parks or wherever you do, as long as it's going to be equitable. Meaning, you know, I may want to bring the South Side downtown to Rotary Park, and it better be available for us and not locked out for the whole year if you guys are gonna be allowing people to drink there. If the city of Lansing, or you guys are gonna be letting that club do it down there, then you better let us come down there too. So that's really my only concern with that. Aside of that, this pandemic is allowing for what is a byproduct of this, your guys' lack of transparency is basically bad customer service. Open the city up, like plainly. Every other city across the country has found a way to do in-person city council meetings and I can't understand for the life of me outside of the fact that we have a coward for a mayor, why we can't open this city up and allow us to have some sort of way to get in front of you all and you to get in front of us. Now Black Lives Matter has expressed that they want to have open forums for incumbents as well as incoming personnel who are wanting to be on city council and, and run for mayor. And I can pretty much uh, I can pretty much predict that the ones who are nervous about having to get in front of anybody are going to continue to have uh, work engagements and out of town. It won't be acceptable. There'll be one every month until November. Uh, we're working, looking to partner with other organizations. You will not be able to hide out from speaking to the people. Um, again, open the city up, man. Plain and simple. And you shouldn't have a problem with that. You got both your shots. What you concerned about? I believe it was 200 city employees that got their shots illegally. I'm outside of that. Uh, the, thin, the thin blue line issue again with the police department, we all know that the inmates are controlling that down there. And by inmates, I mean the police officers that killed Anthony Hulon. So we understand whoever's got access to y'all social media at Lansing Police Department answers to no one. That's obvious, it's dangerous. Uh, and you guys don't understand that this city can and will erupt. I know you all keep thinking that your gentrified neighborhoods and all of the money you're putting into bars and so on and so forth is making the people of this city happy. But unfortunately, the people who are struggling and have fires on their backs and keep screaming and screaming and screaming that there's an issue here will rise up. This spring, this summer, this year is gonna be amazing. It's gonna be fun watching this take place. It's fun organizing. And I'm in some rooms right now to make sure that you guys do not be able to continue this hurt. Thank you. Next is uh, Erica Lynn followed by Amanda Thomas show. Make sure you let them know about Andy's it subject. Erica. Oh, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Before um, my time starts, I'd like to ask for permission to speak on a community event that I did not get. Um, it wasn't approved until about that. eight o'clock. You can include that. Perfect, thank you. Um, so on uh, Saturday, March 20th, um, the Ingham County Health Department will be holding a pop-up COVID-19 vaccination clinic 
um, at the Village Lansing at Saturday, March 20th from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. This is gonna be for people age 50 and over with certain health conditions, people age 60 and up who live in Ingham County in the zip codes of 48911, 48910, 48912, 48906, 17, and 15. Um, eligible residents can schedule appointments with uh, the Ingham County Health Department. The village will be a site with appointment times on there. So you could, that will be available tomorrow. You can contact Mindy Smith at the Ingham County Health Department. Um, you can also go on the Ingham County Health Department site, uh, also the Village Lansing's website at www.villagelansing.org um, or our Facebook page. That information will be on there tomorrow. So again, it is a COVID-19 vaccination pop-up clinic on Saturday, March 20th from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. Okay. And then just let me know when my timer started. Oh, go, ahead. Yep. go ahead. Yes. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, as we enter into the election season, I just want to first start off um, and give a brief thank you to council members Dunbar and Jackson for actually committing to the Black Lives Matter at Lansing Town Hall. Um, also, um, ex mayor candidate Virg Bonero has committed as well. Um, this is that I cannot express how vital of a community conversation that this is that all candidates should want to have with the community. Can't fathom for the life of me why anyone would not want the opportunity to have that, except um, for the lack of transparency that we've been seeing a lot of um, for the past couple of years. Um, I appreciate the very correct and warranted assumption from the committed um, candidates. Uh, they, they are confident that these conversations can take place in a fair and professional way because they clearly understand um, and they value that even through discord and accountability, we can all separate that and still have those very much uh, needed conversations. So again, those are going to be ongoing. Um, and I think that's an expectation from the people that all candidates attend, why wouldn't they? Um, I also wanted to move into the fact that black lives still matter. The silence from this body has not gone unnoticed on matters specifically related to racial discrimination, retaliation. Um, I long for the days where I can enjoy my city again and enjoy the Winterfest mayor propaganda. That would be great. I really would love for us to all be able to enjoy our city like we once could, but I cannot leave people behind. And that is what your administration is doing. And again, the silence from this body has not gone unnoticed. Um, I don't expect pending litigation. I don't accept pending litigation as an excuse. I don't think any of us anymore um, is doing so. It's not an excuse. You can take the people out of public statements, out of council discussions, council questions, hey, closed talk conversations if you need to, investigations, and you can simply focus on the issues. Like I've said over and over, where there is a will, there is absolutely a way, and we are seeing no will in any way, shape, or form from any of you on any of these issues. We just simply aren't. We are seeing the election season coming. We're seeing you come out on the things that I think maybe you think will benefit you or, or look good on a platform maybe, um, but again, we're talking about the people. I also want to point out that Council Member Beth's return isn't unnoticed for me, obviously. Um, it's not even perplexing to me. What it is to me is privilege and entitlement embodied and it's physical representation of when the city wants you gone, they will spend the time and effort and resources to do so and make it happen. And they will give grace that's not afforded to people of color and particularly black men, such as my husband. Um, we are not going away, especially when lives are at stake and we're not here for political games anymore and we will not be placed on file any longer. Thank you. Um, next, we have Amanda Thomas show followed by Rachel Franklin. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. So um, I guess I just wanted to take the opportunity to um, ask everybody on city council to just like reconsider your priorities um, moving forward. Like maybe we've made mistakes in the past, but right now we can change like from now on. Um, I really think that one of those priorities that we need to reconsider and maybe spend more time on is accessibility. Um, I really do appreciate the captions. I, 
love that energy. I hope we can carry that same energy into further discussions, like revisit how long we have um, to raise our hand to speak, uh, think about making the agenda easier to understand so that everyone can participate in government. Um, it's really long and there's a lot of jargon in there that's difficult and it, it'd be awesome if it was more accessible. Um, I heard other good ideas like keeping Zoom a part of meetings. I think that would be really awesome um, just always to have that as um, an option. And I heard um, about reconsidering meeting times. I think that's a really good idea too. I think it's just really important for us to be able to um, talk with you all and like actually feel like we're being heard. And it's not, it, right now it feels a lot like you don't wanna hear from us. You don't wanna give us an opportunity to speak. You don't really care what we have to say. And so you're making it as difficult as possible to participate. So um, well, whether or not that's how you actually feel, I just like, I ask you to consider how, you're, how you make yourself accessible to the community, how that um, might make your community members feel. Um, I also find it really confusing that we're spending all this time talking about where we're going to let people pay to drink outside when we're really literally like displacing and arresting Lansing folks for doing the exact same thing right now. Um, I fear that the same people will continue to be punished for their behavior while um, whoever's buddy buddy enough with the mayor or like has enough money to rent out places um they'll get to drink in the park for free and then we're gonna just i i just think that it's i just worry about the priorities um again um also speaking of priorities um how has how how has it not been on a single agenda to talk about literally just like black lives matter um, the way that Mike Lynn's been treated, the way that Brandon, ba oh. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, next we have Rachel Franklin, followed by Amanda Tom Thomas. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, thank you. Um, this is, yeah. I'm sorry, this is Rochelle Franklin. Rochelle. And I'm just um, following up on a letter um, that I did, that I sent um, to the city council regarding a couple of ordinances that um, was were on the list to repeal. Um, I just wanted to just point out that I think it's wrong to paint with the broad brush to allow parks to, to allow parks to be open during during the night. Um, that's um, ordinance 656.05. Um, parks include bikes and um, bike bike and walking trails and consideration needs to be given to property owners that own property um, that is adjacent to those trails and parks. Um, uh, property owners are concerned about activity during the day, but at least you can see what's going on during the day. To add the worry of, of people lurking right outside my property at night is very concerning. Um, already there's no consideration for maintenance and safety in the park right now. People are setting fires. There are not supposed to be any fires in the, in the parks and woods. Um, littering is, is out of control. People walking large dogs that are unleashed and just noise. Um, at night, that would, would be even worse. Um, I, I wouldn't feel comfortable enjoying time in my backyard at night. Uh, during the pandemic with little else to do, that was one of the, 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 the pleasures that uh, my husband and I enjoyed, sitting out in, um, on our deck at night. Um, again, just to, to repeat, my property is adjacent to the woods. Uh, and, and again, the possibility of people lurking in the dark would definitely diminish any feeling of safety that I have uh, for being on my own property. The other ordinance, um, carrying weapons in public places, kind of goes hand in hand with this and my feeling, my feeling of um, being concerned about safety. The increase of gun violence in our city is, is, is very concerning. I see posts on social media on a regular basis um, about gunfire heard in my neighborhood. This is getting worse. 
Um, imagine someone in the woods shooting. More focus should be given to controlling crime, not repealing ordinances that could possibly increase crime. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Suzanne Vander Pye, followed by Joe Darby. Suzanne? Hi. Hello. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Um, my name is Suzanne Vander Pye, and I'm just calling in support of ranked choice voting. Um, I think ranked choice voting is just a really simple upgrade to the way that we already vote. Um, it gives voters more choices. It eliminates wasted votes and spoiler candidates. It increases the number of women and minorities who run and win races, and it increases voter turnout and satisfaction. I think it's a necessary step toward more fair elections and a more representative government. And, and that's all that I have to say, just supporting ranked choice voting. Great, thank you. Uh, next we have Joe Darby, uh, followed by Hugh McNichol. Can you hear me? We can hear you now. Ah, sorry about the technical difficulties. Right. Um, uh, Mayor Andy Shore, city uh, council members. The subject matter that I would like to bring to your immediate attention is Woodbridge Manor Apartments on Edgewood Boulevard in Lansing. As I said, my name is Joseph Darby. I have called Woodbridge Manor my home for the past nine years. Woodbridge is managed by Princeton Management Corporation. It is my opinion, along with others long-term residents, that Woodbridge is being grossly mismanaged by Princeton Management. The analogy that best describes Princeton Management is the, the wolf guarding the sheep. Woodbridge has 288 apartments and has 21 acres of property. Woodbridge is bordered on the east side of the property by Applebee's and Goodwill Plaza. On February the 28th, my car was vandalized while parked in my carport. The converter was stolen, completely removed from my car. While I am aware of many cars being vandalized on the south side of town. I do, however, hold responsible Princeton management for creating the environment that would allow the vandalism to occur. A brief summary, summary of the examples of mismanagement are backdating lease and documents, some hallway lights out for months, rented carports with little to no lights, abandoned cars for over two years or more in the parking lot, trees down along the north side of the property that have been down for four years, uh, trash, dumpsters, tra trash dumpsters that are often overflowing with trash, mattresses, couches, uh, tables, chairs, uh, inundation of skunks, raccoons, rabbits, and other animals, large furniture items abandoned in the hallways for two to three months, old furnaces, I have a one from 1974, that have worn wires and leaking in the furnace. One of the neighbor's furnace in, in her apartment, when it turns on, it sounds like a jet plane taking off. Uh, large cracks, potholes, and stairs leading to some buildings and in the parking lot. Many of our residents are physically handicapped and severely mentally handicapped, the most vulnerable population. These residents cannot and will not speak up for themselves. They simply do not know how. I have over 100 photos that document the mismanagement and a paper trail that documents our efforts to bring concerns to Princeton management. It is important to note the resident manager is Brian Babcock. In addition to being the manager, he is also the regional mechanical director for Princeton Management Corporation. All complaints that are directed to Princeton management from this region go directly to Mr. Babcock. Therefore, no complaints, no matter how small or large, gets passed. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yes. Your, your time's up, so thank you. If you can just finish your sentence. Me? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, we truly request your intervention with dealing with Princeton Manager. 
management. It is not an overstatement when I say the Princeton management is following closely to the management style that plagued the life of Riley Mobile Home Park that fell in such disrepair that became necessary for the city of Lansing oh. to condemn, close, and okay. relocate. Okay. We need your help. We need okay. your help. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and then we have Hugh McNichol. And Abby Schwartz had her hand up in the previous session. And so I think, OK, Hugh McNichol and then Abby Schwartz. Also, uh, he, Mr. McNichol's using an older version of Zoom. I have to make him a panelist. OK. Can you hear me? Yes. OK. My name is Hugh McNichol IV. I live and work in South Lansing. I want to commend Council Member Jackson for introducing the proposal to amend our city charter to adopt ranked choice voting. For anybody that doesn't know, our city clerk estimates that switching to ranked choice voting could save our city $100,000 every election cycle. Now, I understand that's not enough money to solve all of our city's problems, nor is it the number one reason why we should adopt ranked choice voting. But that money could be used to fill budget shortfalls or used to maintain existing social services that would otherwise be at risk for cuts. That 100000 could mean somebody's job or prevent further cuts to retiree benefits. The cost savings isn't the only reason that I advocate for RCV, though. In fact, I wouldn't even rank it in my top three list of reasons. When voters are allowed to rank their candidates, we can save the time and cost of unnecessary additional election, which allows us to eliminate the terrible voter turnout problem that we experience every local primary season. Another one of the many problems that RCV solves is strategic voting, where some people don't feel like they're able to vote their conscience. We already have Lansing voters talking about having to vote for a candidate they're ashamed of because they don't think that a candidate who they like more has a chance of beating the candidate who they fear most. RCV fixes this problem and empowers voters by letting everyone rank their preferences. In short, RCV is better, faster, and cheaper. I encourage everyone to research ranked choice voting and work to let voters decide this November if Lansing is ready for ranked choice voting. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And finally, we have Abby Schwartz. Thank you. Um, I'm also I wanted to talk in support of ranked choice or adding the proposal to um, change the charter to you know to include ranked choice voting. I think it's really important that um, that the council put it on the ballot so that the citizens of the of Lansing can vote on it. I think, um, as, as it's been said before, it, it allows people to vote their heart. They can vote for who they really want and not worry about getting somebody they really don't want in, in exchange. And um, I think because it eliminates the primary, it, it gets people more engaged and more involved because everybody knows that there's an election in November and they show up and, and we, we see the difference in turnout between a primary and a, and, a, and a November election. And everybody should be involved in our elections and with ranked choice voting, they all can be. Um, and I think because they get their, to, to choose who they want, it might encourage even higher turnout. So I think it's an important option that we should have the chance to vote on. And then hopefully, then it's our job to educate people about it. Uh, not your job. <laughs> Thanks. Bye. All right. That's our final speaker tonight. All right. Well, at 9.38, I want to thank everyone for their participation in this evening's meeting. We are adjourned.